What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is your host, Dan Giffen. Today, we have an amazing guest. His name is Ben Kofresi. He goes by the producer name Kofresi. He's a Chicago-based producer, DJ, and drummer. He's well-known for his unique live performances. He does a really cool DJ, acoustic drums, digital drums, hybrid setup. He's collaborated with well-known artists like Modest Yahoo, Autograph, Flamingosis. He's played major festivals all over the country. And yeah, we talk about a lot of things today. Ben shares a lot about his workflows in the studio, favorite plugins he's using for mixing. Uh, He talks a lot about different workflows and the mentality of producing music, how he used the last year of COVID and the craziness in life to really go all in and invest in his music career and how he did that. There's a lot of good stuff in today's episode, but before we get started, wanted to let you know that if you haven't joined the discord yet then go to liveproducersonline.com slash discord i'm posting new stuff that i'm learning all the time and other people can share tips and tricks producing in ableton Uh, we have a lot of different channels set up in there to help you learn and grow and connect with me and other producers so check that out liveproducersonline.com slash discord and if you don't want to join discord that's totally cool if you want to be the first just to know when new podcast episodes are coming out and other cool stuff that i can send you in an email then join the newsletter. If you want to join the newsletter, be the first to know when new episodes come out, go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. And every Tuesday, I am releasing a new podcast episode, so you can stay tuned for more then. Also, if you haven't upgraded to Live 11, I would love to hook you up with a discount. Saving money is great, so just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buyableton, and I will hook you up. Before we jump into today's podcast, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors, which we love. If you're in the market for buying a new audio interface, definitely check out Audient. They have become a key player within the recording world, boosting a competitive range of studio essentials. They have recently released their new generation of the popular ID audio interfaces, the ID4 and the ID14 MK2. They have really great Audient console mic preamps pristine converters and offer incredible audio performance in a solid compact little box. So check them out. Definitely go to audience.com slash AMP podcast. That's audience, A-U-D-I-E-N-T dot com slash AMP podcast. And it's definitely worth looking up. If you haven't heard for the millionth time about Melodics, you guys definitely should check them out. If you haven't joined, there's a free trial. It's a fun desktop app that you can download and gamify your practicing. It's a great way to step up your skills practicing in the studio with a MIDI controller. Maybe you want to step up your scales or music theory, finger drumming. Or if you're a drummer, then plug in your electric drum kit and check out their large lesson variety where you can grow your skills producing and practicing and while having fun doing it, because music should be fun. So definitely check that out. Go to Melodics.com. You can save 20% off of their subscription, which gives you access to a ton of more lessons and options. So go to Melodics.com, sign up for the subscription, save 20% with the discount code LPO-20. That's LPO-20 and save that money. So thanks to Melodics and Audient for sponsoring this episode. And without wasting any more time, let's jump into today's podcast with Kofresi. Yeah, I met, I met, I met my girl's place in Glenview. Um, my family, we actually just got a new property in kind of setting that up. You know, we're gonna have like a cool spot for the summer, but I'm always here for working and stuff. And we've got two wonderful cats and the cats are not in the room, thankfully, because they'd be, they were just jumping on the push. So I was like, oh man. I was like, yeah, so just like put an arpeggiator on it and let him jump away. Let him go. That's cool, man. Well, thanks for joining the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thomas Fall hit me up the other day. I was talking to him. He's like, dude, you should definitely have Kafresi on. And I was like, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? But yeah, dude, give you like a proper intro, super laid back. We'll just kick it and talk about your setup and what's going on with your projects and nerd out a little bit. For sure. But anybody listening, if you don't know Ben, uh, he goes under the name Kafesi. Kafesi is a Chicago-based producer. You're a DJ, you're a drummer. You're well known for your hybrid, unique live performances with like a DJ, digital acoustic drum setup. Uh, you've collaborated with a lot of artists that I really love, like Modest Yahoo, Autograph, Flamingosis. Um, you played a lot of major festivals like Summer Camp, Electric Forest, North Coast, and you are just unwrapping your push too right now. We were just talking about, and it's beautiful. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Two family, man. It's a whole new world. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you know, they hit me up, and they, they, they. I'm glad that you know everything's all intertwined because uh, I'll explain more like about what's going on with the, the project and everything. Because there's a lot of cool stuff coming up, but 
they hit me up when I was, dude, I was like the busiest I've ever been getting all this content together for this campaign that we're doing. And like, they're like, Hey, can you do this push event? And I'm like, I'd love to, but they're like, can you do it February 22nd? I was like, dude, I literally am like so stocked till like March, like 15th. You know what I mean? So as soon as I'm done, cause I have to do like work for this video game app and stuff. Like after that stuff in my music, I'm turning in my masters for my album, like all this shit, you know? So once that is Zen and out of the way, I can like, you know, I just want to be focused. You know, I want to like, if I'm giving you guys a good push to guy, uh, you know, like video or lesson thing, I'm going to make it good. You know, I'm not going to do yeah. something that's like, yeah, I'm doing this last minute. I like to do some cool stuff, you know? So yeah. no, I mean, your content's great, man. The, uh, latest like full music video thing you did was circle of life. It was like that lion King remix I was watching. That was really dope. And uh, right. a, lot of your, a lot of your stuff's really great. Good quality. So I'm stoked to see more push to wizardry that you pump out into the world soon. So the Lion King one was cool, dude, but I, I like doing the one takes, you know, like when it's like a one camera take and this, I have a new flip coming out potentially next week or the week after of that, uh, the track, the blue dabba dee dabba die. <laughs> like I, I was, but, but dude, we did, but it's on, I, and I did the, the, ch I was able to use RX seven and like really extract the vocal from it. So I wasn't like using like the full song sample and I was able to like cut it up into the push pad and the way that it was like cut up, I was like, this needs to be the focus of this video and then go to the drums. So like, he filmed it and you couldn't see the lights, dude. So I'm like, fuck, you can't see like what I'm playing. So he's like, dude, I'll animate um, like little lights coming off your fingers every time you hit the pad. And dude, he nailed like It's like the, it's like that animation you see on like those videos on Instagram or online. Every time I hit a note, you see like a little like spark and it looks really cool. So it gives it this like hybrid animation feel, but it's actually you're seeing the notes I played. I'm going to actually do like a breakdown of the actual playing because some people be like, Oh, he's just pressing buttons. And I'll be like, nope, here's the actual breakdown of this actual performance. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's all. Awesome. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like that hybrid. And um, that'll be fun. I might be able to show you like a sneak peek at some point, but um, I'm stoked on that because that's a one take. That one is all just like here's awesome. the actual performance. You know, it's not just like cutaway camping footage. Yeah. Love those raw yeah. like that. That's yeah, it just feels more authentic. And that's coming out, you said in the next week. Yeah, it's either the 18th. We might do one push because yeah, we have this whole campaign we're doing now with Instagram and things are starting to really like start popping off. And like, dude, I literally have like three months of content of like, you know, stuff that's new shit, refresh stuff. You know, there's a lot of people that come in and see your project on these new social or social media platforms that aren't seeing stuff from even a year and a half, two years ago. And you can take that content if it was fresh and never got exposure, reformat it, like re-edit it, make it look better, and then put it back out there. And like, so most of the stuff is new, but I do have like, you know, 20, 30% refresh content and it's, but it's dope. Like I didn't even remember some of the videos. I was like, this is great content. And so each post has like a meaning and a vibe. And there's like also in shout out inspiration, it's like I'm going to be shouting out drummers that inspired me. Like I've dope clips of solos. I pulled out from like gnarly drummers, like Thomas Pridgen, Chris Coleman, Aaron Spears. Like it's going to be like quick 30 second clips, like shout out to this dude. And it's just like, I'm excited to, you know, do more with the project, but also spread the wings and give like vibes to other people, you know, showcase people that are inspirations and other artists too, you know? That's really, so. cool, man. I love hearing that. Yeah. I totally found like an old music video I did like four years ago and like dug it up from my archives as I was cleaning up files on my computer. And I was like, this is actually still really dope. And so I like reached right? like, yeah. a snippet of it and like repurposing content like that as an artist is something a lot of people don't think about, you know, cause you're right. You get fans as you grow. And then like, there's a lot of old stuff people don't even see, you know? Very true. Yeah. It's crazy. So just, it's just that flow. Yeah. Just keep flowing, keep putting stuff out. Well, I love the stuff you're putting out, man. Um, and I'd love to nerd out with you some of your technical work that you're doing when you perform. Yeah. Sure. You just talked about, you just mentioned a second ago, you just played live for the first time since COVID really. And yeah, it's a pretty incredible experience. And you're in Chicago. So that was a base station thing. And you've got a couple other. Yeah scheduled coming up soon too right in the midwest area there's a uh, not as much in chicago there's like a few festivals being talked about i know my agents like there's some things going on that um uh i guess i don't have the full confirmation yet but yes there are things happening so we're gonna slowly trickle those out but it's it's a slow build you know in terms of the getting back out live right now you know i'm all excited i was so stoked to play that show but i'm also kind of stoked to like be able to focus more on this internet social growth stuff to create more wave for the project by the time we get back to shows that does translate into people coming and seeing a live show it really does when this when it gets more spread and yep. um it's going to be fun to kind of just create more of a, a community understanding like more of the content in the media you know moving forward yeah 100 percent. it'll be i think pretty clearly defined what all the artists have done over the last year 
when shows start yeah. back in the near future, because either you're going to have a lot of music to put out or you're just going to kind of be playing catch up. I feel like for a lot of us. Quick question. Um, how did you get into Ableton Live? Like, give us maybe a quick backstory on that for people who don't know you. Um, it's funny. I have to shout out. Well, the quick rewind on it is, of course, in high school, I messed around with GarageBand and I actually made like a couple of good beats, but like it was just for fun. And like I had some friends like rap and like go to the basement. And I always forgot about that, but that was like the basic. And like I actually won the school song contest, though, making one of those beats. We actually like made like a live thing we played and that was like on GarageBand. So I was like, oh, that's cool. But then I was always in live bands and wasn't like doing kind of the production thing. And then I was in a band uh, in college and it was a great experience, but it was gnarly to kind of like not, not that it's, I'm not even a control freak, but like I'm kind of more of a perfectionist in terms of sound stuff. And like these words are super dope players and good stuff. But I remember being in the studio one day and the dude made my drums sound so bad. I don't know, like what, he made my cymbals sound like gongs. It was like this producer guy and I'm not even a shout it out or who, what it was, where it was. But I literally was like, bro, these sound like gongs. And he was like, get out of the studio. Cause I, it was like very insulting, right. I guess. Dude, yeah. Out. And I was like, and I was like, fuck this. I'm going to go learn some music production. So I downloaded Logic in that studio and I'm like, I'm going to learn this. So like, I messed around with Logic for a little bit. It was like, this is tight. Made a couple basic things. And then my friend, my sister's friend, this guy named Joe introduced me to Ableton. And he was like this house kind of hybrid, like bassy, like vibey dude. And like, he had this sick, like, um, his roommate and they had this amazing, like just apartment in the South, like loop of Chicago with like this 18 story view, he right. had like an upper deck setup, And he would basically like make his beats looking out at the view and just like hanging out. And dude, like he taught me like the fundamentals of using, like basically just ma- using Ableton, like kind of like getting sounds going and making the workflow. But he was always like, Oh, I don't understand how to make like bass lines as much. And like, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll figure that out. And I remember like, I started to pick it up more and more. And I was like, oh, here's a couple cool ideas. Like maybe I could actually like make some beats and play a set. And I remember like, I even know how it happened, but my current manager, Aaron, like, I guess my sister said something and I got this like set opportunity. I had like four original songs, but I like made a cool little like 30 minute set. And it was opening for a guy named Govinda at the t- upper bottom lounge. Remembering all of this right now in Chicago. And like, I had so much fun, dude. And I was like playing like, uh, for a rapper named Prob Cause at the time and was like touring with him. And I got to go, go out with Cherub and these other artists play like different fests. And that got me used to like producing more. I made beats for him. So it was like, kind of like I was brought in more as like a drummer, a live drummer that slowly got into production. And as I was like touring as a drummer for like rap stuff, I would like learn more, you know, and uh, definitely like hero bus, like showed me some stuff one day in New York, like a few people just showed me tricks along the way. And then like, it did, it's a lot of like tricks along the way from like artists, you know, like, People telling you, I'm mean, like learning the auto pan turning into like an LFO control from um, like a certain homie. And I was like, that like changed the game for me. And I'm like, oh, I can do LFO tool. And like little things led to different paths, you know? So, and I'm always still learning things. Like, I think now I like have definitely the best understanding of the program. And I, like, I'm not a, a certified trainer yet, but I know a lot about it. And I know a lot about like how to make the right sounds and kind of going the traditional route, but also you can dude, you can make things sound good going in a very untraditional route. And I think people, I know I'm tangenting right now, but people I think get caught up on these like programs. Like you have to do this a certain way and yes, learn the fundamentals, but like you can definitely cut corners, not cut corners. You can go around the corner and do some weird stuff and make sure you bring it back and make sure it's not sounding too crazy and you can make it work, you know? So yeah, yeah, I think completely. Cool. Man. I feel that for me too, because and we have a lot of similarities. I've, I've been a drummer. I grew up playing jazz drums since I was just like a little kid, since I can remember. And I, yeah. and I would start remixing stuff in GarageBand and it sounded like trash. It was terrible. Oh, and I didn't man. know what I was doing, but I was having the best time, you know, like a long time ago and just yeah. making little happy accents along the way and learning those little tips and tricks like you were saying as I go. Um, and then I yeah. just learned how to perform my drums live while remixing tracks at the same time. That's really how Ableton came into the game for me. So yeah, I love it over there, dude. I love that. That's cool. And I think having a mentor for me has been really helpful. And it sounds like for you too, like people you've met who have like given you some guidance for sure as yeah. a game changer. But I also find I have to unlearn stuff that I've been taught too. Okay. It's it's easy to like be like A plus B equals C every time. That's not always the case with music. So oh yeah. Funny now too, like when you're making new projects, do you like have some templates you go to, do you like to start from scratch or and use like a mastering, like kind of like rough chain or something like, I, cause like, I don't, it, it's changed a lot with me, but like now I'm in a certain flow, you know, do you have like, 
Yeah. I think that flow state is really just the hardest thing to get into. But I think for me, having really solid organized browser of collections, 10 came out. I just like really organized my collections by tools I use for mixing, tools I use for my main instruments and like favorite presets yeah. that they yeah. use, and plugins. Mm -hmm. And then I have like one for all my favorite go-to effects just to get weird with like auto pan presets and shit. Yeah, for but, sure. That's awesome. Yeah, dude. Well, I love your tracks. And like I said, you've done some dope collabs uh, with a lot of artists that I really dig, like Flamingos is an autograph. But as far as uh, yeah. as far as the live performance, like you said, you just played another show and it felt really good. And I've got a couple lined mm -hmm. up and I just can't wait to like actually play for real humans again. Oh, yeah, for sure. Hell yeah. It's, but, yeah. it's a good experience. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let's talk a little bit about some of your live performance and maybe we can go more into the studio production side of things later. But as far as your setup, I, I watched a lot of your tutorials and stuff over the last year and your performances. And you have a, a setup that I'm really intrigued by that I'd like to maybe start integrating. So I'd love to pick your brain on that, on the technical. Yeah, for sure. But you have like your actual acoustic hybrid kit. So you have like some electric drum pads, you have your acoustic drums. And then you're playing like all real cymbals, which I think is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like real acoustic sound, you know, sometimes electronic music just sounds so digital. But I think like the realism of your like acoustic drums really adds a whole different flavor and a vibe. What does that look like as far as like in Ableton and then also integrating the hardware? Maybe talk about how you're you're setting up your shows. Yeah. So basically the kit, um, would it matter? Does it, would, would pulling up a picture help as I explain it or? People are watching this on YouTube. They'll be able to watch it. Yeah. Oh, six. It's like, okay, okay. Well, I'll get that ready at some point. Um, basically, uh, with the setup, you know, it, it, it is all about making a hybrid of like acoustic drums with digital drums and like the DJ experience. So it's kind of like a three piece. You have like the push pad that I'm basically running with my hands and controlling parts of Ableton. And then you have, um, you know, I have the rolling pad. It's like the 12 piece. Uh, and it, it just basically lets me do stuff that I would probably not do on the push with my fingers because it's easier with sticks. But yeah. I do have similar sounds actually on my uh, drum pad that are on my push pad. Like some of the kits that I use live, I can play some of the similar sounds with my fingers or I can play them on the roll. And I think a lot of people don't know that. So like okay. some stuff works better. Like, cause let's say I'm like, and I'm like jumping around, but if I want to use my left hand on the drum pad and I have my right hand playing, I can do different things and like launch stuff. But then if I just want to be drumming and I need to hit like a symbol, I can use the same sound, but be on the drum pad. You know what I mean? So it kind of gives you like options. Yeah. And um, so it's kind of balanced out. I'm going to talk about it. Maybe I can pull up a cool picture. I actually might be able to even show you this thing. Do it. Um, yeah. Really the way it is, is uh, like there's two situations. If I'm doing a show, I basically have Ableton and my electronic drum pad going into my audio interface. So I can control the mix level of my drum pad myself. Yeah. I don't rely on the sound guy making my drum pad. Cause like some songs I'll turn that up. Some songs I'll turn it down. You know, it's like some varies. I, I want to have a certain controllable element. Yeah. And then that's the only stuff that is really going into the interface and it's sending out to the audio guy. And when it leaves is my acoustic drums can then be controlled by the audio guy. So I don't want to control my acoustic stuff. Cause again, I need like a PC tower to run my setup with, drum yeah. controlling right now or unless someone has a hack good it's just all the different mics i've done it it just doesn't work like i want yeah so i'm basically yeah, i'm running the drums separately from the track and the uh the digital drum you know so it kind of comes together and in, in like some sound guys get like kind of like oh no this setup looks intense and then they realize no you're literally just sending me a left right and then a snare two overheads and a talk back and so like, that's the nice thing is it's actually really minimalistic yeah. with what I'm giving to the sound guy. Cause I don't know if people want to take some like live feedback from making a setup, don't make it too complex for the sound guys. Cause they'll be sad. And then you might have something that gets messed up. Like as much as you can streamline yourself and control yourself and then send it to the guy is always my best advice, you know, with this, cause if something's going wrong, like I have like 90% of control of my, at least my left, right, and my audio, you know, rely on them. But I make sure, you know, a big thing too is the symbols I use. I actually talked about this in a recent post. I use ozones for my crashes because ozones have holes in them and they have a much more shimmery, airy tone to them. Yeah. So instead of sounding like a gong, symbols can be overpowering, but these symbols have a little less like frequency space they take up. So it's like using almost like a digital symbol, but they're a live symbol, you know? So 
when you layer it over with an electronic sound, it has more of a spacious tone as opposed to like a cloudy sound, you know? Yeah. And uh, it definitely works for live shows. I mean, and honestly, I mean, I have to kind of check myself because I, I sometimes I want to play the cymbals more than I should because like those crashes are overpowering and I want to let the track shine. So I'll make sure that, you know, the track is the main mix. The drums are like there, but a little bit under, you know, so because even in some stages that you're going to hear those live drums, you know? Mm. So I try to make it like the track's the star. I always tell the sound guy because I want them to hear the electronics and everything. And then the drums are very present because I've, you know, I've seen leave people nameless right now. But I've been to some festivals where I've seen some artists with live drummers that like, that's a big part of the band. It's like, they're the freaking dude with the drummer group. And I couldn't even hear the drummer live. And I'm like, I see him playing. And that is like a bummer. Cause I'm like, he's killing it. Yeah. So it's like, don't make the drums too low, but don't make them too hot. Cause then it literally, it sounds so bad if you make the drums too hot too. Right. So it basically in terms of that, yeah, what's up? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. And if you don't have a mixing engineer that you can travel with, that makes it really tough and nice to have that control. Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, you have to basically be able to trust yourself and also just have like this, like faith in the sound guys that, you know, I mean, you can kind of hear and tell what's going on, but it's just like, you want to feel comfortable. And that's what the setup is about, you know, is integrating all these things where it like seems technical or complex, but at the same time, it's actually like, a very comfortable situation. Like I don't want to be on stage and anyone that's, you know, performing, you don't want to be on stage and feel uncomfortable. And there's always going to be some elements that might make you uncomfortable, whether it's like, I don't know, like getting too sweaty or you can't like find, you don't have water. Like that's actually a funny one. Like I was playing even this weekend. I was like, Oh, I forgot to get water. So I'm on the mic. Can someone get me water? And the mic's not working. <laughs> so, and the funny real quick on this, which is funny though, people, I was talking on my mic and because the mic wasn't working, kids were like, man, that's crazy. You were sampling your voice and turning it into those crazy sounds in the track. And I was like, you know, I'm going to have to start doing that. But I'm unfortunately, I don't bum you out, but I wasn't like turning my voice into every sound because the mic just wasn't on and I was just trying to talk. And like, there were a few kids that were like, dude, you made that bass out of your voice. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I didn't do that. <laughs> you just be like, yeah, so, really, yeah. <laughs> and it's it still, and they were like, they're like, oh, it was still a cool set. I mean, they, they didn't care too much, but it was funny because I think some people really thought that that was the case. And I was like, oh, I was like, that that wasn't the case exactly, you know? That's amazing. Um, I'm finding a cool shot that I can pull up at the same time. But uh, basically, I mean, my kit's actually gone through a lot of changes, man. I mean, the, the first variation of it, it actually was just more electronic. I'd like want a little bit of symbols on the left side. Um, and then slowly I was like, I can make this more of, you know, who I thought of Danny Carey, dude from tool. He's like, yeah. talks about his drum set is like, uh, a more balanced thing. And literally that's like why I was like, let me make my kit more balanced. So I started getting symbols that kind of made it feel more like a kit and like, you know, having like the chopper symbols I have on these fronts, which I'll pull up a picture in a second. Those are like additional hi-hat tones. I have like a shaker on my right. That's another type of hi-hat tone. So I have like I had with open clothes with a remote that lets me like control my Hyatt standing. And then I have the other two tones and the, the then the, what is it? The shaker. Um, and then I basically have my main symbols and I have splashes and a big change now in that Lion King video um, was I added a right side splash. I used to only have a splash on the left and that is cool. But I'm like, again, the Danny Carey concept balancing out, having that splash on the right as well. They're just like an eight and a 10 it lets me like do so much more in terms of like accents and like hitting yeah. certain things. And there's uh, a, a great track. I have to do a little clip of this, but there's this great producer. Um, his name's Eliminate. I don't know. You've probably heard of Eliminate. So, maybe yeah, maybe not. That. Yeah. Yeah. He has, he has these two tracks dude. that I actually heard Arl Grime, like made this post and like, I randomly haven't seen Arl Grime on Instagram forever. And he was like, Oh, this track is sick. I was like, I'm gonna check that track out. And I was like, dude, this would be so sick to drum to. Cause it's so percussive and i was like whoa let me play this at this show and dude like it was such a good example like i'd even like get to really play to it practice before but like the chopper symbols and the placement they hit with those kind of songs so well because they layer a percussive like tone yeah. um and it's like yeah you have to check out that track it's called moolah by uh eliminate and it's like the second drop in moolah i like inverted my edit so it goes second to third drop but i love tracks that have like these percussive elements and that like really lets me like do what I do with my kit. And beyond that, you could be melodic with it. A quick rerun going back to just the evolution of it. Again, I used to have, I actually did, I had a, a push and, you know, I had a launch pad and a, uh, two drum pads. I would use a Yamaha and then I would also use a Roland. I had the, the Octopad. So oh, yeah. my initial kit was Octopad, Yamaha, or Yamaha pad, Octopad, or yeah, Yamaha Octopad, the Roland pad, a launch pad, 
and then like a couple symbols. And then dude, when I got the push, that was like a game changer. So yeah, linking back to some Ableton with this, like mm. that was huge. Cause I'd always figure out how can I get away to use like a launch pad type interface, but I want the knobs and, and my solution. If you look at the Sandman video, my solution in Sandman was I made this like plate that would like hold the launch pad with the, uh, I think it's the focus control or not the focus control. Oh my God, that's innovation. It's like this mini key control that has like eight knobs on it. I think it's by Akai. Or Akai. I saw that in your video with the launch pad. Yeah, yeah. And and then I was like, is there anything that does this together? And dude, I was looking for options, options in one day at Guitar Center. This dude's like, we got to use to push. Cause I was like talking about it and I was like, all right, maybe I'll try that. <laughs> so then the heavens opened up and there was like angelic voices singing as you were taking it home. <laughs> Yeah, I was, well, when I, when I realized what it could do, um, in terms of just like controlling things and like, I used to have to MIDI map, like certain parameters, like filters or volume to the, to the Akai little mini control. And this just has things built in, you know, if you're going to a certain element or if I want to control certain things, I can do that with the push, you know? So it definitely changed the game in terms of making an integrated device that allowed me to kind of have something all in one that I didn't have to like to use two separate things. And it kind of had more control than other things too. So it was like, something that definitely brought the setup to a different place. And because of the push, I then was like, how can I rearrange this to make it even more cozy? So like, as of recent, the Lion King video, I used to have my digital pad on the right and my push in the center. And that was great for certain stuff. But I remember being like, I want if I'm drumming, I want to be facing the crowd. I don't want to be like off to the side, which I usually am sometimes on the left side. So I'm like, let me put my push to the right so I can still be on that like angle toward the crowd, but like right side mixing view. And then when I'm going to any part of drumming things, it's like center focused with extension symbols or basically like I'm going to like the full on drum mode. And that's going to be like just I, I can access like my fills because I use my toms are actually all on the the uh, the roll in pad. So like I don't have real toms. I would love to do real toms, but can't can't bring too much in a dude. I travel this whole thing in two suitcases and a carry on oh, the whole setup. Fits in, yeah, it's it, it's all p- piping in tubes. Yeah. So. Yeah, the um, let me see if I can actually. Yeah, there's this picture here. I mean, I don't know if you're seeing this stuff, but you can kind of see like I used to have the uh, see the drum pads on the right, yeah, and the uh, the push is in the center. And no, look at dude, that's when I used to use the uh, that's the launch pad days. That's like from I'm just showing like my older version of my setup. That's the launch pad, that's a great. Show. Um, and then I basically with the Lion King video, I switched this, so yeah, I now have the the drums and the all focus in the center, push on the right, and it's made it more fun to play honestly it's like a much more like cohesive kind of like flowing setup as opposed to just like let me like perform on this thing you know yeah, yeah 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 and that's cool because like a lot of times djs even if they are doing a lot of stuff nobody can see it nobody really knows yeah They're like are they up there actually doing anything we don't know like you're playing the drums right like with the accents and the percussion the the, the pad of the push and then you're also playing cymbals and a live snare but as far as the kick goes, the kick drum is in the stems, right? For most of the time when you're playing. Yeah, and honestly, that's that's a that's a, it was a challenge to get used to because I did I used to play in a, a cover band in college. I was like, dude, the kick drum is so loud in your tracks. Why am I playing a live kick over this? He's like, you just should do it. And I'm like, but it sounds bad. Like it was like wompy, you know what I mean? And I was like, okay, if I do my project, I'd either want to control my kick outside of the track or be standing and like control my hi-hat, but let the kick ride out. And that was then a new challenge because I'm like, it's kind of weird because I'm a drum set player to not be connected to my foot with my right foot. So you actually have to develop, like I call it like, it's, it's like phantom kick awareness, like literally like a phantom limb, but it's like phantom kick. So I'm like feeling like when there's accent points, like for example, like a beat, like boom, buka, boom, boom, boom. Like I know that like I can be hitting like, and I like yeah. have the awareness of the kick placement in my head. And I almost like play like there is a kick. Yeah. So like I'm hitting those accent notes on the hi-hat. Like uh, when you're beginning drums, you always try to like line things up. So like a basic, like if you're beginning, you'd be like hi-hat, 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 like ta, 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 ta. But in my head, I'm working around the, the kick drum. So you have the kick drum going boom, boom, boom. I'm like, oh, ta, 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 boom. I'm doing like the syncopation accents around the kick or I'm hitting the accent with it. But I, I call it yeah, phantom kick awareness. Like I'm kind of like... <laughs> It, it's a new type of challenge, you know, because yeah. people think, oh, it's easy to play without that. But like, dude, go like, I've, I've been practicing with a metronome since high school. Like, if you don't know how to play with a metronome, go try to do this and try not to f- go or try not to flam. Deitch talks about flaming all the time. Like, it's like, flaming's the worst it's when a drummer is like not playing to the track and sounds crappy. And like, of course, there's probably moments where I've like flammed a bit, but I like try to be locked. And you can kind of usually hear it live. Like, I like, there's not as much flaming going on, you know, and that's just metronome, Chris Coleman 
told me to do that in a video of his from high school. So, yeah, yeah. totally. I can imagine like, you know, in the times I played percussion and stuff, I've always played kit as well. So like when I'm not yeah. using my right foot to play the kick drum, if I feel like my right foot's like naked, it's just like, it's weird. Yeah. It can, it can, I, I actually should be probably practicing with my, uh, a pedal again. Cause I was like playing a kit and it felt good, but I was like, Ooh, it's been a while since I used my feet. <laughs> my, my right foot, like my left foot is used a lot for the hi-hat, but like I can still do it, dude. It's just so much muscle memory with drumming and like being that coziness. And like, dude, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's a, it's a gnarly instrument. Every instrument's gnarly, but I feel like guitar and drums, especially are like to get really good. Every instrument's gnarly, but yeah, yeah. those ones are like, they require some like extra type of precision and grit. It's, it's like interesting if you really want to be good. Especially when you're playing with backing tracks that are so locked into time and the groove already. Mm -hmm. really play in a sense that makes everything really fit cohesively is tough yeah but that's cool i mean as far as like running your stems with these tracks i mean you do dj other tracks and then you play a lot of originals obviously so the the, the trick is oh my bad you know yeah no go ahead so what i like to do is there are um basically with layering live percussion with tracks there's two things i like to do with tracks that i'm playing live I'll actually remove some of like the certain layering of the percussion so I can play it live with my pad or I can add like, I don't, let's say there's a hi-hat part that's doing a specific pattern. I might not want to play that live. So like, I'll like either remove it or you can like use a really nice EQ and just like scoop that frequency out. So it's like subtle, but you're going to layer over it. So that actually I balance between on different tracks. Some tracks I will basically like remove hi-hat parts. Some tracks I'll basically like pull things out, remove certain snare elements. Um, what I like to do now, though, I mean, honestly, it makes it smoothest for video stuff. I'll have like multiple track sends for shows. I like to basically make groupings that I can choose live. So like, it's not like I'm like pre-planning a whole set, but I basically make certain um, like groupings of certain tracks and certain vibes that I spend a fucking, excuse my language, a lot of time, like like customizing for shows. Yeah. So like, it's not as much about breaking down every single stem and playing it live. It's about making something unique and special that's going to uh, translate to the kit that's going to allow me to freestyle and play it different every time, but also like add a whole live element that's like filling in and adding more, if that makes sense. So it's like, um, and I will like definitely like for certain sense, I love to play elements of those live with like, uh, I can use serum and that doesn't late get latency. So that's nice. I like serum with live stuff. And, uh, so but in terms of like fully breaking out every component of the track, I noticed that actually kind of got a little bit like, I think when I was doing more drumming and less of the push, I was like, oh shoot, like I can't launch like five of these with my hand and like be hitting that two symbols and hitting this on the pad. So I was like, how do I do this, but also make it very authentic, you know? And I'm, I'm not trying to do a full pre-recorded set. I'm also not trying to do it. So something's going to go wrong. So there's like that fine line of customizing and making the songs like basically the live versions are very different than the studio, you know, like even this blue remix, the studio version in the, the in the video is a whole different sound with the drums and the studio the, the live version is a whole different like raw sound than the studio one you know so it gives you like spaces cool because I, like a lot of times when i go to shows and if you have like a favorite track of an artist you're going to see a lot you hear that track in your head you hear it so many times when you hear it live and it's a little different whatever that looks like yeah. it's kind of mm -hmm. like oh shit like people love that that little element of surprise yeah and making just special, like, I mean, also with like edits, I love now like doing, you know, portions of a song that either goes into a drop of mine or inverting a part of song, my song that goes into a flip drop or then cutting it up where like you're doing really interesting layering of like another track over years that I'm doing more blending stuff live. So it's like there's smoother transitions. Like again, with the Eliminate guy, I was able to blend, he had his track, what's called Crystallize and it's the same BPM as Moolah. And dude, this edit I did for this show, like, I haven't seen kids like this kid lost his voice. He was like, dude, I lost my voice when you're playing the, the, the eliminate tracks. And like, there's a video that someone had from the show and I hear him screaming. He just like, he's like, let's fucking go. Just like screaming the whole time. And I was like, it's so much joy to take something that people might recognize, but then customizing it, making it your own, adding like a live element to it. And then it just totally flips up their head a lot. Cause they're like, I never have heard that. I've never seen someone do this variation of it. And it just like, it lets you be creative and enjoy things. And you, I mean, and I do that between my own tracks. I like to play, you know, with sets like honestly 70, 80% original, but like toward the end of the set, I like to like go into more, like let's fucking get down and like, let's play some more um, recognizable stuff, you know, in the scene at the same time, I'm even debating, dude, people get so down to stuff that like, they really know that like, I might sneak in a little more because I'm live drumming and I'm doing customized edits. Like 
I don't mind if this is more of like an entertaining experience. Like some artists are like, you have to just play your original music. Yeah. Totally fuck with that. At the same time, you want to give people a good time in a show. And this is just some insider vibe. Like feel free to like, if, as long as you have some tracks that are dope and you're putting your stuff in, like give some love. It, it, it's like giving love to other people's sounds. And like, if you're adding something to it, like, I think it's just more the merrier. It's not like you're playing other people's music. You're giving, you're, you're spreading that vibe, you know? And if people resonate with it, then just do it. You know, it's like, don't do like an hour of it, but like, I mean, unless you're a club DJ, but you know what I mean? Like it's okay to play people's tracks as long as you're like doing it authentically, you know? I, I agree completely. I do the same thing. I play a lot of originals and do a DJ hybrid as well. Um, mm-hmm. Hear that one song, even if it's like not yours and they still love it because you're creating experience for them. People want to have an experience and you're doing that. <laughs> Hey, you wanted to take this time real quick to remind you to check out Audience Interfaces. Um, I mentioned earlier their ID14 MK2 uh, and the ID4. Um, they deliver a lot of really awesome studio recordings with their Audience console mic preamps. They have really great converters. If you're in the market for getting a new audio interface, definitely check out Audient. Just go to audient.com, A U D I E N T.com slash A M P podcasts and look them up also big thanks to melodics for supporting this episode as well they make that really cool desktop app it's a great way to grow your skills plug in almost any midi controller it's great for finger drumming and playing scales on the push as well as my midi keyboard i also play drums they have an electronic drum kit lesson variety so you can grow your skills that way as well check that out go to melodics.com m-e-l-o-d-i-c-s.com and use the discount code LPO-20 to save 20% or check out the free trial. And back to today's episode. Thanks for listening, everyone. People want to have an experience and you're doing that. 100%. Talking a little more about like the technical side of your live performance before we move away from that, I'd love to, to c- talk about a couple other things. Like You're not always playing your snare for each song, right? Because maybe yeah. times you're like having a, a layered snare stem that's like playing instead of that. Um, so I assume a lot of times you're not actually smacking your acoustic snare when you're DJing, say a full bounce of another track that's not yours. Is that yeah? There's so I do a few different things with that. I and now actually I have a new clave that's like this soft clave tone that layers. See, it's crazy. Like this little clunk that layers. I played at the show actually for the first time. It layers so well over tones that you don't want to have a double big snare sound. You know what I mean? You want that extra little like clunk, you know? But um. What I like to do is like Deitch actually told me about this. Um, if you guys don't know Adam Deitch, he's yeah, Adam an amazing Deitch. drummer. Awesome. The lettuce, they're great clients. Yeah, like if anyone listening, amazing guy. Went to Berkeley. Um, I really like. I he was one of the first guys that got me into understanding more about like playing with electronic music because of his work with Pretty Lights. And I saw him with Break Science when I was touring with Prob Cause, and I'd see how he would have different percussion tones, but he'd play the snare at different uh, volumes, different uh, intensities. From you know, there's the ghost notes. There's like the main like marching snare hit, like where it's the rim or the, the main part of the drum, there's the rim shot, there's the stick click. There's like, honestly, like a bunch of different tones you get from a snare. And so the point is, is like, based on the vibe, you can layer that appropriate tone. So like some tracks, they don't need the full smack. They just need like that nice little, like that little, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. A little pop. And then like some tracks, the snare is a little bit weaker and I want to add that pop. I want it to go harder. And then some tracks I'll, Literally, even if it's another person's track, I can like, I'll do it. I'll go in and I love this plugin. Uh, you know, Soothe. Soothe is nice. Soothe's great. Yeah, they sponsored the podcast. Oh, really? Soothe? Did? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's a great company. Sick. Okay. Yeah, they're awesome, man. I love Soothe. Yeah. I, yeah. I literally, I just got that like a month ago and it's been such a nice, like, especially for turning in my masters, bro. Like, I didn't, I'll be honest, there's some tracks out there I think people need to, to use Soothe on. <laughs> like, dude, there's, a lot of tracks that I'm like, y'all didn't use, like you should have used Soothe, like especially for vocals or hi-hat tones. I'm like, fuck. And I'm like, it still sounds good, but dude, there's some tracks out there. A lot of tracks that I want, especially with this album, I'm literally doing all my reprocessing quick masters with like, yeah, they're Gulfos, you know, Gulfos or Gulfos. Not really. It's a, uh, it's an EQ that basically it's an artificial intelligent, not a mastering plugin. It's just an EQ that acts 300, every 300, 300 times a millisecond or something. I'm going to, I'm going to do that number wrong, but it's like an artificial intelligent live EQ that tunes the sound of any sound to the most pleasing harmonic elements for the human ear. So did you check it out? Individual tracks, full master mixes. Like I literally went back and threw golf us on a couple of the tracks from the album and it, dude, it bring it, it, I almost want to show you this on, you can see my computer, right? 
How do you spell Golfus or whatever it's called? G U L L F U F. Okay. I'm, I wish I could switch the, I don't have Ableton on this computer that we're on because I could go to screen mode and literally show you it working with like a track, but this is for people who are listening more. So it's not as much visual, right? Yeah. Without doing the visual for it, you basically have this like, it's like a very nice little like EQ, just like an Ableton EQ, but uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it, it has this like magic, like I almost call it, it's like black magic. It's got these two little, like a bunch of little knobs, actually little frequency things you can change, but the two main ones to mess with are tame, literally just mess with tame. And, uh, what is the other one? Oh my God. It's not, it's not enhanced. I'm going to forget the name, but there's tame and like the one next to it. I should learn that right now. Yeah, that's cool. But dude, what it does, it just like the tame subtly pulls away frequencies, like almost like soothe, but like not as hard. I feel like not as intense as soothe. Yeah. But it like subtly pulls frequencies out and then the boost or the one next to it brings a little more frequencies in. But just because it's bringing a frequency in, it might be reducing something else to let that other frequency shine. So it's not just boosting. It's like, there's this really weird, like kind of like, dude, that yeah, 300 times, like a second or millisecond it is like this hyper intelligent EQ. That's and cool. it's really cool because it, my secret, I mean, if one people want some advice right now, use that with Soothe, bro. It's making my mixes sound like the best they've ever sounded because you should use that in your mastering chain. And don't, I don't like put these on like really hard with the levers. I'm using like little bits of them. But like when there's, I've noticed I'm listening through, I'm like, oh, that snare was a little bit sharp. I don't want to go back into my track and retune the snare and re-export it. I can literally put on Gulfist, literally like use a parameter. And this is like, this is another little hack. This is not something you probably should do, but this is something I've done. And it's sounding great right now as a master that I didn't want to go back to the full mix, made a new full master file in Ableton session, put Soothe, Gulfoss, and Fab Filter L2, and just did a quick tweak. So any of the adjustments aren't going to peak, but basically, dude, it sounds so good. And it's letting these mixes like, like they sound powerful, but not harsh. And I think that uh, it's just a cool tone. You're going to hear it really on like the first single coming out that I won't say exactly uh, what it is, but it's, um, you'll hear it. And it just has like a very nice tone. I think it's a better sound than anything else I've put out. Shout out to Soothe. You guys are awesome. That's tight, man. Yeah. And I actually used, I used Soothe actually in this set because I was, there's a couple moments in the set where the highs are a little sharp when I was like making some of these edits and I basically threw it on and I can actually, if I want, dude, I can control the, whatever that gain is of it. So if something live is sounding too sharp in my in-ears, like just turn up a little bit. And it's like, I'm just doing that little shelf around like eight to 10 to 12. So it's not like I'm doing like a whole thing, but if it's just feels a little sharp, my ears, I can like do Mm. some Soothe live and it doesn't use, doesn't like cause latency. So, um, it's a brilliant plugin, super DSP yeah. friendly, which is what we yeah. love. And honestly, I'm not even diving too crazy into like customize. I just use like, I just move around a little bit of the band and just kind of go with it. And there's like a million deeper controls, but just the fundamental like element and just don't go too hard on it. It's just fucking yeah. awesome. So yeah. Some I of the presets are really nice too. Like some of the drum yeah. ESing presets for vocals too. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah. I want to use it more when I'm like really starting a track. Cause this is more, it came in on the mastering end. So I'd love to use it more. So in like, I'm just, you know, tweaking little harshnesses, but to actually make some stuff with it would be awesome. You know? Yeah. So, for sure. Technology is getting wild. I feel like it's good to have all the raw concepts of mixing, but it's so easy to get lazy with these plugins where you just throw it on. You're like, boop, it's done. Sounds good. Yeah. Nice. That's where the element of creativity is going to still be a big factor with all this. You know, I think that people can, it's so easier, so much easier to make good sounding music now. Mm. There's some amazing artists out there, but I mean, and I'm not like any crazy, crazy thing. Like with like, I, I definitely have a unique sound I like to push, but there's a lot of people that sound so similar right now, dude. It's like, what the hell? Like literally it's like this, I'm not going to say who, who, but it's like, I was going even searching, you know, crate digging for some new tracks for this set, like even like a month and something ago. And I was just kind of like, what like so many of these artists the new songs they've put out i'm like y'all like i literally wouldn't know who's who if you played some of these back and forth like the vocals are using the drum tones the synths the pads the bass elements it's literally like all of it's like carbon copying dude and it's like i don't want to sound like that so this album that i will talk about in a second is not going to be like the carbon copy shit it's got like a unique sound it still sounds great but it's like not like the exact it also has the elements of what is important though in terms of like things hitting hard you know so it's just like, it's, it's an interesting game out there. So it really is, man. It really is, man. I agree. Like having that originality, I think a lot of times in electronic music now s- starts with samples. Like for me, I've started doing a lot more of my own sample design. And I talked to Ill Gates about this in a podcast not too long ago. And he was nice. talking about like doing all of his own custom drums from scratch with like DS kick, which is like, amazing. Thing. I love the DS drum synth series in Ableton, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff makes it really easy just to like fast 
like really tweak your own stuff from the ground up pretty quick. That's awesome. Which is a good time. Actually, I, mean, I haven't looked into that, so I should look into that myself. Yeah. Like, I love it. I see. I love stuff like this. Like little, not like we all know a lot, but like yeah. you know about golf. Hunts. I didn't know about that exactly. So yeah, you know, I want to check that out. So I've learned so much. Like I'm an Ableton certified trainer, but I feel like I've learned more doing this podcast just from people like you. It's been fun. Yeah. Yeah, dude, Golf Plus is a beast. What is what is that you just said? The DS, yeah, the one in Ableton? Kick, DS Snare, DS Clap is really cool. Um, it's all built in now to Live 11. So if you just type in in the browser DS Kick or whatever, you'll see the whole DS series. It's a drum synth. I think it came out in Live 10 as part of like a pack. And now it's like built in. I have, I have a DS Rack right here. Is that the same? It's an instrument. So like if you go into... Yeah, I might not have... Oh, dude, you know what it is? Yeah, I need this is a new computer because my computer went boop and I reloaded everything on it. I don't have my suite on this one. That's what it is. So I just have like nice. the fundamental. Yeah, to, this is literally to, to, to finish my master's. And then because uh, the new Max, I have used Final Cut or I use Final Cut. Um, I have to go to that new operating system. And do you know, great question for you, are most plugins good to go on Big Sur? Do you know about this or do you use Mac? I'm actually streaming right now on an M1 Mac Mini. And uh-huh. It's the best thing to ever happen to my life. I'm not kidding. I love this thing. Like highly recommend okay. to anybody who's a Mac head who wants like, you know, once you go Mac, never go back. Big Sur, yeah. I have any problems. The only problems I've had with Big Sur are two like really small things that are dumb anyway. And that's like, yeah. I had trouble with sound siphon, um, mm-hmm. but then I had problems with some wave plugins. But what like, see, it's weird. Like I, I use like one part of, I should just go to Ozone 9, but I use like one piece of Ozone 8, like one of the little like compartments from the mastering thing. Would I haven't, I think Ozone Isotope's probably fine, but I have to look into that. Yeah, I use Isotope for mastering all the time. I'm on 9. But is Isotope, are they good for Big Sur, you think? I know this is like a random yep. question for the yep. thing. Okay, awesome. They support it. So Isotope is, is awesome. Um, I use all their all right. stuff too. So yeah, you're not going to have a problem with most plugins. I haven't had any plugins except for Waves, like I said, that I've had an issue with and I've got like a shit ton. Have you tried Drip? What do you think of Drip? I haven't you played Drip, but I get hit with like a billion Drip ads every day. Dude, the Drip ads are heavy. They're dripping with ads for they sure. Really are, yeah, this is true. Yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, shout out to them. They, they definitely have a cool thing going. It's it's uh, it's definitely worth checking out. I'd, I'd recommend that. I just literally, it like was showing up in my VSTs and I, I have used it a bit for some sounds. I actually did use it on this blue remix for one of the sounds I was making. It does, there are some really cool presets. You can do the two little knob thing. I ain't going to do an ad for them right now, but it is like what they say. So yeah, right on. Is, I'll have to check it out. I I out about it. So it's good. Yeah, to yeah. Somebody like yourself, yeah. I can actually vouch for it now. They said a Geico is coming out with a, a plugin too. It's like Ge- a bass with, a, with the, the gecko, the gecko gecko. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. That'd be hilarious. Yeah. If you speak it the right amount, you get like a, you say 15%, it reduces 15% of your top shelf. That's amazing. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> what a deal. What a deal. Yeah. yeah. It's going to like sample like the hump day camel. Yeah. They do have great ads though. I will say they, they've had some funny ads. The one with the, the pipes dude with the, the bagpipes. I don't know if you've seen that one. I don't think like I- we have a pipe. There's like a person in the house and they're like, we have a problem with our pipes. And then it's like a dude playing bagpipes under their sink. It was just really funny. <laughs> so yeah, actually this, this does make sense um, for what I'm kind of doing right now. I actually was a marketing major in college. And the reason I didn't pursue fully going to an agency is because of a state farm project we had for ad practicum, not any dissing of state farm, but the year before us got Coca-Cola they got to make some cool ads. We had to use insurance dude. And it was like, not fun. <laughs> And I was like, oh, this is what the, this is what it, we had to basically do an, a mock advertising agency. And it was it, obviously they're a great company, nothing shot to them, but like the experience of doing that, I was like, that's not what I want to do. So when I got the opportunity to go tour with this rapper, I was like, oh yeah, that'd be fun. You know? So like um, I was working for Apple at the time. I actually used to work for Apple um, and yeah, I couldn't work for Apple anymore because I was playing too many shows and they're like, Hey, can you come in? And I was like, oh, I can't make it. And you know, I, I, it's just funny. Like they're very strict. So I was like, yeah. basically i chose to play music you know and it's it's definitely been a, a cool path yeah so good choice you made a good choice in state farm though yeah that was literally like definitely had an impact was doing that project i was like okay i don't want to be working for an agency so let me have some more fun first <laughs> you know so but shout out state farm they they do help people shout out state know. farm yeah yeah being good neighbors out there that's what i yeah hear. I actually have a similar story. I quit my big boy job doing marketing for an ins- uh, travel medical insurance agency. Really? To music wow. and to pursue doing Ableton stuff and teaching and playing. So that's hilarious. And where are you based? I'm in Indianapolis. We're basically neighbors. Oh, sick. Okay. Have you been? Wait, did you come to any of the shows I played in Indy? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw the end of your set. I got there really late because I had a lesson. But yeah, dude, I was. Oh, okay. It was cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I feel like we've met in person. Obviously, you just look familiar. So I get the face thing. I don't know. I people tell me yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, it's all good. But, but there'll be you know, there'll be more. And, and, and anytime I play there in the future, I'll, I got you on the list, man. Dude, that so, would be dope. Um, yeah, no, I would love to. Man. I'll I'll share it and promote it too. Hell uh, yeah. Hell yeah, man. So let's talk a little about about your like studio production. We nerded out mm -hmm. about the live stuff. What are what are some of your favorite like Ableton stock devices or instruments that are your go to when you're producing? Oh man, definitely um, EQ. I, I think the EQ8 is a great EQ. Like I know people use like I mean that's the thing. People use so many uh, VSTs for things that like Ableton has so many good stock plugins that like like even like dude, like reverbs and stuff. Like people, I know Valhalla and all this stuff is sick, but like you can tune that reverb to sound great. Like you can make it sound great. Like you if you know how to work with the plugins with Ableton, you can make them sound great. Yeah. So I like to use the EQ from Ableton. I like using, I love the ambient medium reverb to use like little, like little splashes of tones. Honestly, using a little bit of ambient medium on like even certain, like little bit of it on drums that like let things sink in a bit, you know? Um, I love, uh, it's funny, even just the basics too. Like I'll flip up cathedral and like into like this thing I call, I don't know why I call it, I call it the ASN verb. And it's just like a really big reverb that I made that just like lets things like sound big or gate out. Like, and just like be like, it's off of these fundamentals. Like I honestly, I don't think I've even scrolled down to the bottom of the, the, the main reverb list on Ableton because I love what I was able to do when I first learned with these fundamentals. And, you know, um, so definitely that I really like using like instances of combining a uh, chorus with flanger and making a little uh, yeah. a group with them. And then, you know, if you uh, combine, you know, their, uh, what is it? The dry wets into the same um, macro, it just, it sounds nice. If you like play with the filter placement of like where it is on the axis, it yeah. makes some really cool sounds of a nice blend of chorus and flanger because the flanger chorus does take away some of like the, the bigness of the sound and flanger builds it back in. So I always put the flanger after the chorus and you can get a really cool sound with that. Um, Brilliant. And yeah. then, Sorry, not to cut you off. I was going to say that fun. it makes sense because, uh, you know, in Live 11, they married the two together. So now you have the chorus and the flanger in one device. Oh, that's great. I, there you go. Yeah. So yeah. maybe they, they read my mind. That makes sense. That they were spying on me, dude. They were like, this guy uses that a lot. And the, um, what else do I really like? Uh, let me actually look at, if I'm like in audio effects or I'm, I mean, let me just pull up a chain real quick. Like I know my, Might as well, I'm just looking at some stuff. So are you on live 10 right now then? Yeah, I'm still on 10. I, I will get to 11. I've just been, you know, I think after I send in these masters for my album, I'll move to 11. I just look so comfortable in case anything, which it won't happen. It's just like, I just want to guarantee like something doesn't, you know, like you can, and then all of a sudden, like, uh, or randomness, like whatever, like a, a synth might not load properly and it sounds weird, you know, like just weird shit like that happen, which won't happen, but I had happened before. So I'm just being safe, you know? Yeah. Um, I, oh, I love auto filter. Wonderful. Auto filter, auto pan, you know, doing um, high pass or low pass with the auto filters are great, you know, controlling like DJ scoops and stuff. Auto pan, I use it as a, you know, a panner itself, but using it as an LFO is wonderful sometimes. Getting, you slide kind of the placement of the, uh, what is the name of this one? The uh, phase of the offset or whatever. Yeah, the, the phase and the offset. I mean, you can get like great results for like, you know, especially making like your subs move, dude. Like when you have like, I used to always wonder how do they make like the sounds move together? And it's like, you can like make sounds really move together, like by just using auto pan and like making the same ex actual, like copying like the thing over and like you're making it work for like the right sound. But you know, people use LFO tool and I use it uh, sometimes too. But I've been, you know, using auto pan and gating um either using utility to like get control the volume so instead of it being like if you want like a like, let's say a bass has like a uh like a it like resonates or has like a tail and it's like a one 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 and you want to just make it clean i like will use the auto pen but then cut the the volume it's like one 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 what what yeah. you know you mean so it's like you can get a really good result using like utility and auto pen as like lfo control you know so um i love that uh i really like redux is definitely fun sometimes um for certain moments i do like redux oh, bro play um, the, new redux. the new redux in 11 huge facelift really yeah. it's, what's different it's what's like different? my favorite saturator now it just sounds like well they have a dry wet mix on it so you can dry wet the redux and then um oh, that's huge damn it has a frequency uh bit reduction from like 40k to zero uh, and then it has, there's a couple other things I'm blanking on. It has a, like a pre and a post filter. So you could like filter the in and output. Uh, yeah. And I, use, I use Redux on some of my tracks. Maybe I need to like redo my album now because of the, yeah, the just new, new everything now. And start out. No, that's cool though. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. I mean, there's obviously reasons I'm going to go to 11. It's just right now I'm, I'm able to get waiting to be done for this album on 10, you know? So, but 
but dude, hundred percent, I'm, I'm, I'm getting super stoked on 11, especially with this conversation. So yeah, uh, that's huge. And then, yeah, dude, I mean, honestly, those are the main ones. Like I've used saturator a bit. Oh, obviously delay delay is awesome. Yeah. I've used the blue compressor for drums a bit. Um, I used to use a limiter, but then I went to fab filter L2 for all my limiting stuff. So, yeah. uh, and that's kind of, the, those are like my main ones. I mean, I, yeah, in terms of the audio effects, um, in terms of instruments, operator is always a go-to for like a nice sub layer. If you have like, I mean, a lot of bases, even in serum have great sub, but like, I like to kind of usually scoop out the low, low sub and just get that guaranteed thickness of the Ableton operator, yeah. just layering in and like using the same envelope automation or LFO. And it just sounds, it layers up. It's fine. You know? So yeah. that's something that didn't make any sense to me when I was first getting into this. It'd be like, how do you make that work? You know what I mean? Like, cause some yeah. bases would be so wompy sounding on like serum. And I'd be like, how did you make it so clean? Like and there is a trick. I mean, there's different ways to do it, but that's one way, you know, is like scoop out a little bit of that stuff in the, the synthier bass. You have that top end of the bass, then just make the exact same thing happen with uh, the low end, you know, with operator. So I would follow. And um, I really like, I mean, obviously I use the drum racks uh, for production when I'm doing stuff. I mean, even with, uh, with this blue remix you'll see coming out like that is example. Like I got the idea that song came together because of making a drum rack out of the the vocal you know and then being able to play it and making different variations of it and um i wish i had that session pulled up dude i've been like going i literally if i look at my recent sessions it's like <laughs> so many edits and things like because of like the set and like working on my masters i'm like oh let me find that file easy to find them but like you think you're working on something and you look at your evil re- open recent and you're like that's on the list anymore you know what i mean like that's true i get that, that one is off the list for right now it's, it made it to i've done so much other stuff yeah but yeah, I mean, those are my kind of go-tos with like what's in Ableton. Um, there's really, I don't use a ton of outside stuff. I mean, really when I'm running, I don't know if you want to know what outside stuff I use. Cause it's sure, like, yeah, yeah. Stop, uh, let me just see my, my go-to babies. Obviously fab filter L2, um, more for like mastering stuff, but it just like, it's definitely changed the way that I can like make things sound a little bit cleaner and bigger, but not like pushing it, you know, like it's just, it has a really just nice process in the way it works. Um, really cool one is called gain reduction. You know, gain reduction is made by, uh, oh my God, J like this producer guy named like JJ something, or I don't know. Um, JJ not Jay Snyder. I mean, what the JJ bird. It might be JJ bird. Oh, I'm, I'm going to look it up real quick. I got to give this guy a shout out. Cause yo, gain reduction is gnarly. Um, it's basically, it's kind of like a super saturator, I guess. And dude, like you can throw it on like any instrument or vocals and it adds so much body and so much liveliness to the sound that it's just like, holy shit. Um, it's changed the game for making, like, I wish I had this honestly for like some of my previous records with vocal work. Cause I just wasn't as much of a stronger vocal producer. Like, I mean, I have a co- like new thing. I think I used a little bit on that. That's like my best vocal song. that's done the most success on Spotify that people are like, Oh, we love that song. But there's some other tracks like in the past. I'm like, dude, if I had, had gain reduction, bro, it's just like, even like I saw, I have like a collab coming up with Modest Yahoo and like definitely used a little bit on that. And like that just has a really cool tone with like some of his vocal stuff. And it's more so on the, uh, just some like, did you sound like anything, but like there's this remix I have coming up with this band Too Close to Touch. We'll talk about other stuff, but like using that, they had this guitar stem they sent me and I like used it on the guitar and it just adds so much body. And like, so you literally, dude, it's like, don't get, the, there's a number two, I think now. But just start with the first one because it's a simple one. Yeah, don't do the deluxe. Do regular. Yeah, yeah, I'll check that out. I've got like a shopping list just from this conversation right now. Yeah, you can see it's got the two knobs. It's got the, you know, I think it's slay and gain. I'm guessing there's slay and gain. And then there's like this middle one that says like body or like, it basically you can make the sound have more body or more like tinny or tone. And that works actually. For some things have too much of a womp, you want it to sound less body. Some things you want more body. And then the slay just makes it sound fucking nuts. It's like, Right. and um golf i already talked about that lfo tool I, I use that not as much now but that's great um serum definitely my go-to synth mm-hmm. uh soothe is now in the up is up in my using things oh wider is sick wider is a free plugin that makes things just wider. wider but it keeps the uh so wider is like the only kind of stereo plugin that dude series recording me like talking right now it's so funny it's like all this weird text <laughs> it just said like I bought an estate. It said I bought an estate. I'm like, I didn't say that. Oh wow. Uh, it was like I bought an estate. So uh yeah, basically wider, it, it keeps the uh the mono presence, but lets you have that stereo sound. So it's it's basically like a hybrid stereo mono thing. It like it's a wider sound that dude automating it, you can have like that moment of width and come back in. Like 
yeah. it's a lot of cool things you can do with it. So wider, like using a little bit of it, you can also go beyond wide and go to 200% with it, which is weird most of the time, but some sounds it might sound great, you know? So you can basically go to 200% with, with that plugin, which is more than people usually do. That's I do that with utility sometimes. Um, especially cause you can make yeah. mono as well, which is really nice on utility for sure. Yeah. Utilities. I have done that trick where you like go to like your Insta, where you like right before a drop, you'll pull it into the more of the mono and then you open it back up, you know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And th- so those are like, Oh, and then I've been using RX seven, like a bit recently for these new flips and some, even some track stuff, just, uh, it's amazing in terms of the way it can like, yeah, dude, like the music rebalance thing. That's, that's insane. Like sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't for me anyway. It, I think it probably just depends on the track you're putting it through. It does. I think that it's, um, use it for like, what's a use case for you? So you cut out, you're saying for wider, it cut out for a second. No, I was saying for, uh, the rebalance, like taking out stem. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So basically, um, especially with like, I, I did, I wanted to flip, this is more of like a flip thing, but I wanted to flip cold plays trouble just to make like a fun, this is like, like during quarantine. I was like, not even like bummed. I was like, this song used to mean something to me. So I just want to make a flip because I have, I have this new tool. Let me test it out. Dude. I was able to extract Chris Martin's vocals so clean using RX seven and like have this flip that I'll maybe play at some point. It's actually a really vibey flip right. that, uh, it basically it let me extract the vocal and the piano and some of the bass as individual elements as opposed to like just cutting it out with like an EQ or like shelving it with like filters. And it's just so much more pure. And um, that was like my test and then applying it to the blue remix was great. I mean, there's even some songs, like if you guys have, if people are making a track and the vocal's really low, you can put it in there and like literally do a vocal boost and it actually does a really nice like vocal boost. So like if something's kind of lost in the mix, you can reprocess it and just make sure you're like, not like choosing a section of it. I just put the whole thing in and bring it back out. It's like, you can literally make stems out of your own music too. It's crazy. And like, obviously not like, I would do it more from the track base, but yeah, you can do some really cool things, you know, for like making an edit, you can pull a vocal out or do different things. So yeah, there's options. Yeah. Machine learning is ridiculous these days. Like the fact that we can even do that, like five years ago, I feel like if you'd have told somebody they'd been like, no way, like that's pretty yeah. cool that we have that option now. It's going to, it makes me really wonder like, where's music tech as far as like the software side goes with like even stemming out and doing any kind of machine learning stuff like that. in like 10 years from now, it's going to be insane. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. Just like sink our brains to the computer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the cool thing is like, um, is having the ideas in your head and translate to the music. I feel like that becomes much more like doable. The more you understand the program, you know, and like mm-hmm. literally I've heard like a baseline or an idea where I'm like, as you get better, or under, now that I understand the program, I'm like, Oh, I can actually create that. So let's go like, try that as opposed to like, you know, you have an idea and then you're first starting out. It's like, Oh, that's nothing like I thought, <laughs> you know? So it's cool to have things actually like apply and yeah, be able to be disabled and stuff and understanding these like fundamentals and the, the controls I use, like you don't need like, I mean, yeah, you can have, I like, I have more of a studio set up at my place with like all these different things that I can go into and like, you know, use more of, but I'm like, I've been able to get so much done to with just my push and my computer and like going into studios or listening in certain spaces that as long as I'm referencing and I'm making sure like you can mix them up. People always, Oh, you have to have the exact mixing space. Yes. I used to like to use certain fundamental things for mixing, but I've been in a situation where I'm getting an edit for a show ready or doing something. You can have even like a basic speaker. As long as you hear like some bass tonality and you know, your levels in Ableton, as long as you can reference a track that sounds clean and you know, that's a good mix, you can start tuning it to that and at least get to like a better place, you know? So, and then you bring it to the big studio or not or whatever your like main mixing zone is. And then you just fine tune it. But it's insane how you can literally make like 95% of a song these days, not being in studio, you know, yeah, and it's true. like, or even a hundred, there's, there's some big tracks out there that were made like literally not at all in a studio. Like, totally. yeah. You know, like Al's, uh, Al city or whatever his name is the firefly song. Yeah. 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 Uh, that song was made in his dorm room. Like I think his like sophomore year and on garage band. And he ended up like selling tons of copies, made a lot of money off that track. Really? That's the garage band track. Yeah. He, well, I don't know if the final master was like uh, in there, but he, yeah, he wrote the pretty much the whole song garage band. Wow. I mean, I bet there's, there's, there's been some garage band beats. I'm sure that have made radio at some point, right. you know, I think, yeah, yeah, it goes to show. I mean, like you don't have to have the fanciest plugins and everything to make great tracks. And like, I'm sure you've done a lot of the same too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's, uh, it's a different game out there. So that's dope. It's true. Facts. When you're recording your drums, like, do you record a lot of your live drums, acoustic drums, like in the studio, or are you programming most of your beats? Cause just listening to your tracks, it sounds like most of the time you're programming like a lot of your drums. Yeah, it's funny. I'll do both in the way of, I will uh, sometimes perform them with a rack in the push. And then like, 
either I liked how I played it or I'll, you know, I'll quantize maybe some part of it or I like to have a little bit of realism to it. So everything's not like the perfect gridded. It's like, it's mm-hmm. definitely like to the click, you know what I mean? But also it's like some of the best songs aren't always like perfectly gridded. You have to have a little bit of that live shift. Dude, I'll do both. I mean, sometimes I have like made beats or I've literally just pulled samples and then brought stuff in. I really do like the process of like kind of either thinking of a beat that might feel good to play with my hands and then translating it to the production. You're like, I'll think of like a rhythm and be like, Oh, that'd be cool. Like make, turn that into like some Ableton drums, you know, or like, so I start literally with honestly, yeah, like those three different vibes. I'll like be making a beat with the drum rack. I'll pull in samples. I'll literally be on my kit and be like, Oh, this is a good idea. Let me turn it into like um, a sound, you know, and I've literally like played my Roland and sampled that in into some songs for sure. So it just kind of, and then you can also make an idea and then, you know, like the sounds just replace them. But now these days I like to like people say, be confident with the sounds you're using. Like don't use as many fillers, you know, like yeah. don't be like, Oh, this baseline's cool for now. I'll go back. You're like, Oh, do you make it like, at least make it like much more what you want within the moment, you know? Yeah, that's true. So, Having a good like preset library and knowing, you know, your sounds, I feel like is a lot more inspiring, like out of the gate. Cause I know for me, if I have a better sound from the beginning, I'm going to be inspired and probably take a different direction with the track than I would otherwise you know, rather than like, well, here's this shitty cowbell. I'll just leave it until later, you know, or whatever. But yeah, I, th- but, I think what's up. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, I was going to um, actually tangent into something else. So let's not keep going. Yeah. That's all we do here. This is just the tangent podcast. Really? <laughs> really? No, my, my friend was trying to get a tabla. So I'm like, I don't know where to buy a tabla <laughs> online. Yeah. Tabla would be dope. That'd be awesome. Maybe even on yeah, no, he was yeah, he was just asking about. It. I'm like, I don't. I mean, that's you know, Amazon, bro. They got everything. Amazon has tablets. So you ever look at Reverb.com? They, I, I, you know, they actually came out of Chicago's Music Exchange. I don't yeah. know if you know that they're they're built out the Music Exchange. Yeah, yeah, they've, that's where I buy a lot of my gear. A lot of like either B stock or new or lightly used gear. I I get everything from there. Yeah, I mean, if, if, what do you usually get your stuff from? Like, what's your main go to? Yeah, usually reverb.com. I used to use Sweetwater, but then they would like call me every holiday and like on my birthday and it's like like, hey, hope you're doing well. How's your kids? It's like I don't have kids. Stop calling me like every day. <laughs> no, but I do love Sweetwater. It's a great company. And like if you want to pay full price for awesome customer service, I feel like that's the move. But if you're just trying to like snag a cheap deal, I like I like reverb. Yeah. It's well, I, I actually yeah, I should start supporting them because I, I use a bunch of different stuff. I used to go to Guitar Center a lot um it's surprisingly dude i because of quarantine like amazon is hooking up a little bit with some stuff nice um and they've definitely like this shaker i needed was like i was like i need an lp shaker and i'm like i don't have a guitar center and like amazon's like we'll give it to you tomorrow morning and i'm like but it wasn't it literally was like tomorrow in the afternoon i was like wow yeah amazon prime life man i'm all about it it's funny because like i pay for amazon prime and like i feel like i'm like always saving money because I have prime so I can justify buying more stuff. So I end up just spending more money because I have prime that I pay for. I don't know. It's a weird concept. I think it's kind of funny. I'm sick though. I think prime's like actually, uh, I mean, well, dude, I think it's putting out a lot of businesses though. So it's actually kind of scary. The amount of stuff they have that exists on Amazon. And I'm just like, wow, like, dude, I got these GoPros and I'm like, I need some batteries. And they're like, I'll give you three batteries and a charger tomorrow for like third of the price. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm just like, dude, like, how can you not? Like, I mean, it's, and I don't want to be savage. I'm just like, okay, this is kind of what? Are you okay? Yeah. Sorry, the cat got sleeping in a funny position. That's funny. No, I feel that though. Like every time I'm on my Amazon, it's like, well, you could bundle it with this and get this. And other people also bought this with this. And it's like, oh, cool. Yeah. I'm saving money. I'm just going to keep buying more shit. Yeah, it's hilarious. You, to need to, you have the Ableton Amazon bundle. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you got a push too and a box of like Cheerios. The box of Cheerios, yeah, yeah, for some flaming hot Cheetos for all the producers out there working late, a little stoned. Yeah, yeah, that's actually fun. Yeah, I mean, and just talk about quick with production stuff. Like, it's crazy how those late hours can be so productive, dude. Like, I, it's just like I'll work great during the day, but man, like, I'll be like, oh, I'm gonna chill, and then I'm like, oh, I want to work on something. It'll click at like twelve thirty or one, and I'll like work till three a.m. and get so much good work done. It is just like fuck, and then like it's it's a gift and a curse because sometimes like my girl has to go to bed early and like, I want to either get up earlier or that'll be part of like just more like hanging out and I'll just like end up working late. And it's due to the productivity levels are just like insane. You know, I, I definitely think like there's a little boost at night and um, it's, you know, I used to smoke those big vapes. I don't really do that as much, but I have like these little tiny things and like, I don't smoke cigarettes, but it's, there's a Zen that you can get from like, I don't know. It's like, I don't want to promote nicotine or anything, but like that late night buzz of like working and then, yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know I mean, I'm like, just, there's this like, 
everybody has their flow state, right? Like whatever gets you to that point, whether it's vaping or at 3 a.m. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like at night, I like to produce later in the evening. I find when the sun's down, I just feel like more creative somehow in my dark cave when I'm making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just my thing. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Totally. Have you ever, have you ever made? Do you ever do you ever start ideas on ever on a plane and start an idea? Yeah, yeah. Like I have my Bose noise canceling headphones, which are terrible, really, for mixing. But like it just yeah. all the sound of babies crying and stuff on the plane, so I can actually like really hear. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, no, I love, I love doing plane. What about you? It's an interesting Zen on a plane. If you're like comfortable and like, you kind of get a nice view and like, it's just fun. I don't know. I've had some fun, like working yeah. on a plane. I've also had some stressful moments where I'm like, Oh, let me do something on a plane. I'm like, Oh, I didn't get enough done. Oh, I got, I gotta go play a show now. Yeah. Like I've been like, there's been some funny moments on planes, but, um, you ever have people staring at you next to you, like on the plane, like thinking you're like some kind of alien on your computer with like Ableton pulled up and all these crazy colors that happens to me. I feel like every time I do that. Yeah, I had like I've had some funny situations. One guy was like really interested in one time, and that was cool because he's like, "This looks like some crazy program." He's like, "What are you doing?" And it was like actually a good conversation. I had kids ask. Mostly people are chill. Like I, one time, I had this dude using Ableton next to me, and I had to bring out. I had to work on shit, so I was like, "This is gonna be like I'm not trying to look like I'm flexing. I don't know. This will be awkward right now because he's working on something. I'm like, I'm about to bring out my computer and work on something. And you know, it's not even like a moment of that, but it was funny." Cause it was like just the vibe I could tell you was like in his zone. And I'm like, I'm about to be in my zone. Yeah. So we're like both vigorous on our computers and like, all right, look at each other. Like what you making, man? You know, it just, it was funny. It was just, that was like a few years ago. Where I remember that distinct moment of like another producer next to me, you know? So funny. You know, that's hilarious because, uh, so Dennis, he's like, in charge of the whole Ableton certified training program from Berlin, super yeah. German guy. He's got like a really thick, awesome accent. And, uh, if we were in, uh, Pasadena during our training and like getting in an Uber to go to a bar or whatever. And the Uber driver, whoever was like asking, uh, so like, what do you guys do? What are you doing here? He's like, we are music educators. <laughs> That's like all he said. It's like, it's just like literally just cut him off. And then afterwards he's like, I don't, I don't want to talk to people about what I do. Everybody's like, Oh, music production. That's so fucking cool. And then they want to talk for hours and tell you about like how they love country music and like all this stuff. And he's like, no, I just want to sit in peace I just want to like be able to be on my phone, text and do what I need to do. But yeah, it's hilarious. Hilarious. It's yeah. It, there's uh there's a lot of funny situations that come up with us, you know, like where we're working and doing things like where's, where's the weirdest place you've produced the song? As yeah. long as it's work, 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 say what I'm saying. What's the safe for work, weirdest place you've worked on music? The weirdest place I've worked on music? Yeah. I mean, like had to do something or like had to make like, I don't know, like back, like, you know, in the- like real talk, probably on the toilet. There was a time where yeah. I, I was like literally so far behind and I had a show that day. And so I literally was just carrying my laptop around like the kitchen, like making a smoothie and stuff, like still programming my set. Yeah. And I just sat on the toilet and like finished it off. <laughs> that happens. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. That's that there's, there's some honesty right there. That's a, yeah. What about That's, you? I get probably, probably, probably the same thing. I was like, I was going to say to do an airplane bathroom. I was like, nah, that'd be the next step. Is yeah. doing it. Do you making a be in an Ableton or airplane bathroom? The, that's the next level yeah that really my actually uh dude one of the worst things that happened which was funny though is i was going to play a show one of these quarantine shows and dude i go through security someone grabbed my computer at security uh, and put it in their bag and they and they left their computer because we had the same case but this was at ibm and i was like oh my god dude so they, they go through the airport trying to find the guy he got on this fucking plane and takes the flight i'm like i don't have my computer i don't have a set i gotta go play this show what the hell Shit. Thank goodness, bro. Google Drive, dude. Google Drive. I called my agent, dude. I got so lucky. He's like, I'm with this DJ right now. And he has this computer. We're in the hotel about to go to the festival. I'm like, bro, does he have Google Drive? He's like, he does. I'm like, here's my login info. Download this now, dude. They were in there for two hours. I'm on the plane, in the plane, dude. Let they're letting me call people. On, I've told the stewardess, I'm like, we have an emergency. I need to talk on my FaceTime or whatever. She's like, we'll let you do that for like half an hour. So like they let me talk. We're not supposed to do. They let me like talk in the corner, getting coordinating which files to get. And then I'm at the festival, like behind the stage, like last minute, putting everything together. Dude, like right before I had to play, there's like a lightning storm that almost canceled my set. Yeah. And then they're like, no, you're good to go. And I was like, dude, to the last moment, wish I could have gotten a nap because I was exhausted, but I had a great set still. But like that, that was like, I was working on like a dusty, like bench, like with like getting hit, almost hit by hula hoops. Like that was intense. Talking about cutting you know, it. Yeah. I thought for a second you were going to say that you just like took the other person's laptop and then like used your backup flash drive and performed. Oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> that'd, that'd, that'd be a cool story though. Yeah. That'd been... No, that's pretty wild though. You actually performed at Electric Forest in 2017 
the same weekend I played. And I saw oh, that sick. I saw that on your feed. And that was like one of my favorite shows I've ever played, man. That's awesome. What, are, what, what are, stage did you play? Uh it was the one of the smaller forest stages. Forest to stage, yeah. Name of it. It wasn't the actual main, main bigger forest stage. It was a smaller one next to it. I'm trying to remember the name of it right now. Uh but yeah, it was that was an amazing experience, man. Such a magical place. What's some of your favorite shows you've ever played? Oh man. Um honestly, dude, one of the favorites is uh is a uh, grid life. Grid life, dude. Grid life is uh is a it's a car drifting event. They do it in Michigan or or in uh they did it where's the other place in Atlanta. Bro, it's like pro drift car racers and they have like a fat stage and they like every time like I only I played like three times, but Every time they give me a good slot, like right before the closer, or like two times before the closer, and dude, people, the crowd was like, it was like my first biggest crowd thing was like 2,000 people, like all, not even on that many drugs, they're just all drunk. And they were so stoked, dude. That was like, you know what I mean? Like a festival, I mean, if people want to have a good time, like I'm obviously like, I smoke weed, but I don't really do too much crazy stuff. And I yeah. played some sets where people are so out of it, they're not even like paying attention. They're just like floating around. Yeah. This show was like, everyone was so hyped to hear live music and like, all the other times I played, like it was such a good time. And I have such, I have cool footage from that, but just getting that like good feeling of like, wow, this is what it's like to play a fucking festival. You know what I mean? And yeah. definitely the gnarliest though, is when I, I played with autograph um, for a moment, I was drumming for them for like a tour and we got to play EDC Mexico and did that where they're like, Oh, you're playing early in the Tiesto stage. So I thought it was gonna be like small ass crowd, dude, we go up. It was like, no joke. I think it was like 12,000 people. Like, but they were, it was so far back. The people were so far back. I it was like a sea, and like I was like I was like autographs this big, and it wasn't even like that. It was just the the festival had a guaranteed built-in crowd because of Diplo was playing like three people later, you know. Yeah. So that was insane to walk up and like, dude. And my another bag situation, my bag didn't make it. Um, so I just had my rolling pad, and I didn't even would have need my real drums because they would not have fit in that gnarly stage. But I just used my drum pad and was just like, no one could really see the drum pad, but I was hitting my sticks and just looking at the crowd that. The weird thing, dude, I'll be honest with those big stages. I'd honestly probably prefer like the medium, large venue size much more than a giant festival. Even I almost feel bad for the, not, I don't feel bad. They're making so much money, but it's so um, disconnected. These big artists that play the giant stages, dude, you're like a hundred, 200 feet from the first row of the crowd. Yeah. And like, it's a huge disconnect. Like, yeah, that's great. You're on a big stage, but give me a venue any day over that any day. Dude, Any I days. totally agree, man. That you feel that energy and you like actually get to see the faces of the people that like you can really feed off of their energy and the vibe of like them feeling you and you feeling them. It's like the best thing in the world. Really. Yeah. yeah. I th- I feel that too cuz I ended up opening up for Tiesto here in Indianapolis at the Panic. Oh, yeah. And like I felt the same way. That was like my first really big show ever. Yeah. And like I could barely see the crowd. I was felt yeah. like I was up there by myself just dancing around. Yeah. I still had fun, but yeah, I feel like like- it's, it's, it's epic for sure. Like it's just it's not all about just playing in front of big crowds. I think people get that messed up. You know, they think, oh, I just want to be like big and play big crowds. It's like, dude, it's more about like the experience and the feeling. And I think like getting a vibe crowd, a vibey crowd, like uh, I I'd pick a vibey crowd of a hundred people over like ten thousand, just like far away, kind of like kind of into it. You know, it's just uh, that's what's more fun. You know, for no, sure. I feel that man. It's real talk. It's so true. As far as like upcoming projects you have, like what's coming up in the near future? You mentioned like the new remix, some other things. Yeah. So thankfully, dude, I mean, you know, if you, if you had, I'm glad we actually waited on this interview a little bit. Cause if you had hit me up even like two and a half months ago, I'd have been like, man, quarantine kind of fucked us up, <laughs> you know, but and it wasn't, it was just, honestly, I had a lot of things that were going to come out last year that got put on hold because of COVID. And like, even we had this big opportunity with my album and that literally fell apart. And it was like a huge crushing moment. Cause like, I mean, literally we, we deal with these ups and downs with music and like, that was gnarly. Cause like, that was like the whole trajectory of 2020 it was like going to put this album out in August and do all this other cool stuff that all fell through. And like all the releases beyond that were like, that doesn't make sense now. So we got to put a hold on everything. I'm going to do other content. Let me learn more about the push. Let me do more content. So I was like, just kind of playing around, honestly. And then I realized I go into the new year and you're like, dude, cause I think it was a mixture of that. And like, I'm not like really a depressed person, but like that plus winter seasonal, the kind of depression, like I just wasn't in my normal element. Yeah. You know, I was like, I was like definitely being creative, but wasn't as much working on like my own, like, okay, let's make some new music. It was more like, let's learn more technical. Like, let's have fun. Cause I was just kind of over like the, it was frustrating dude. all that work felt like it was gone to like waste, you know, in a way. So it's like, kind of like, I don't want to be making stuff if I'm not in the best headspace. And so I wanted to kind of like enjoy life a little bit. Cause we're all inside, you know, I started playing like not, I don't play too many video games, but dude, this game, uh, I I've been supporting this 
group. I know I'm a little tangent, but why not? I'm supporting this group called uh, uh, Creature Studios. I used to, I you know, EA Skate, you know, the skateboarding games, like Tony Hawk. Yeah. So like I'm a huge skateboarding fan and I love physics-based simulation. I love deeper experiences. I don't really play like shooters and random stuff. Those are dope, but like I'm more into like, I love skateboarding games. I love like physics simulators. And this company has been like slowly making this game called Session. And dude, at first it was like, oh, it was all right, like this and that. But I've been talking to developers. I might get some music in it at some point. And I've been part of like helping them like give feedback and this and that. And dude, like the latest update they put out, um, I was playing this other game, skating game called Skater Excel, and their developers like fucked off and literally like are not doing shit with that game. And so Session took all the feedback that the community wanted for that game, put it into their game and dropped this update, bro. It's the craziest physics skateboarding simulator I've ever played. And it's such a mental break and literally was like such a positive thing to like enjoy. And then like playing VR and stuff a little bit, like got me to just like play some games, not crazy, but like enjoy like a separate experience. That's like, it almost like got me excited to make music again. It was like, just and appreciating the process of them creating that game was like, dude, it's fun to make music too. You know, like that's a, it's a whole different element. So yeah. that kind of in a way was like a weird, like, Thing that got me hyped like seeing a, a team a small team make something so amazing it's just like wow like you know you can do yeah. cool things with the tools we have and that was like literally inspiring so like i go into the new year and i was like okay how do i re like get things going and basically was like let's figure out a thing with this album you know let's get another label um that we can like work with let's just make some content around that and dude like i went so hard january and february and basically was like, I'm gonna start this whole campaign of media. Like I said, I'm refreshing stuff. I'm making a bunch of new things and to talk about what's coming up. I basically now have a, this, a really cool performance video, full a song release with this blue WD of a die by Eiffel 65. It's just like the Sandman, but in my new studio spot, it's really cool. I got the visuals with that really stoked to get that one out. Um, I've been filming a bunch of cool clips in my studio. I don't know if you saw the one on Instagram it was like the three camera angle GoPro. It was like, it's a recent clip I posted. Yeah. You can check it out. It's yeah. got, and that's like, I basically have a bunch of those that I've put together that are like kind of little quick 30, 40 second jams of like really quick edit, shouting out other people. I want to do more for my original tracks, like for upcoming content, but dude, like it's so fun to <laughs> take a track that lets you showcase how the setup works and like being kind of like, here's how you can play like the symbols with like the, the sounds. Now what's funny with that video though, is I'm going to, um, the compression on, on Instagram I don't know what they do with the, the the audio quality, but it brought out a lot of my highs. So I need to, I'm going to crank my highs on my cymbals more for these next clips on those GoPros because dude, like you can hear my, my cymbals, but they were way louder in my Ableton mix and in my, any mix that's in my computer. So Instagram does like shelf. I feel like some high end or I don't know what, but just, it's just compressing the shit out of stuff. I think it's pretty much what's happening. Yeah. 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 It still sounds good. It still sounds good. I just listened back and was like, I would like my drums a little louder. So I'm doing that all the next ones, but dude, I have a ton of these contents that I've filmed. And so we're going to be doing basically like every two days on Instagram, I'm doing these really cool posts that are just like new content or, you know, just uh, different types of stuff you might not have seen um, from before. And then I have this uh, after blue, we have this remix with this group called too close to touch, which is a big um, alternative rock band on epitaph. And, uh, met them a few years ago by doing a bootleg remix of theirs that we didn't do it put out, but the dude hit me up because he heard the Lion King remix. It's funny how things are full circle. And he's like, bro, I heard that shit on Spotify. And I was like, I need to hit this kid up, do a remix, you know? And it's like, yeah. cool. And I ended up making it such a, it's not even at all like the Lion King. I made this dude. It's one of my, like probably my most, like, I don't want to say poppy vibes, but like a cool ass, like more like, it's not even like, it's not like house, but it's got a little more of that four on the floor feel, but dude, it's like his vocals are, really cool and very melodic and like uh, emotional and it's also like a cool like it's like this poppy like badass kind of sound then it has like this kind of like juxtaposition of like these like really dark but also uplifting lyrics you know what i mean so but dude the way like it flips and i did the chops and then the drops that are more chorus like kind of vibes with the vocals it just like goes and then the last section of the track is like this like it reminds me of you know the song the numa numa song the Na, 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 na. what is that it's like numa numa yay numa numa yay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The numa, numa song. yeah yeah i don't know why dude but it doesn't sound like that but it, it's got this catchiness i made this like vocal like hook loop with like a vocal i tweaked and it like did he like heard it and he was like they hit me back when i heard the version they're like bro <laughs> this is cool he was so stoked he was like i was gaming with my friend and i showed all my gamer friends and they were like what the fuck and so epitaph is officially going to put it out as like a full collab drop. So all the viewers will see it. We're now figuring out just the last content for it. I might make a performance video. I might do some kind of push thing for it. 
Um, we just wanted to look professional. So yeah, that's yeah. the last for that. And then after that, dude, we might be starting to roll out, you know, hopefully early as June is the first single from the album, which is going to be a track uh, called cycles. Really stoked on that. I just, I played it out my first time this weekend. You know, I did it in a stream, but it's the big test we played on a stage. And that one I think has like some of the cleaner, like kicks and snares of like the album and the way the subs hit and dude, people were just vibing. Like, I was like, yes, like, it's just such a good feeling when you like, you know, there's tracks you make, you're like, that might, hopefully it sounds good live. And you're like, this is going to sound good live. And I can't wait to play it. That was the more of the feeling with that track. And like that plus another song um, with a dude from Chicago called his name spades, a track called truffles that actually closes out the album will be the last single but in between that we're going to put out this big collab with modest yahoo called daylight and um it's basically a feature where he has like a main hook and then this rapper from jamaica is doing the first and second verse he's literally sounds like this american rapper in the first verse and he has like this like jamaican swag like literally like the rasta style in the second verse like Joma, da, na, na, you know so it's got like and then you have modest yahoo doing like the the build-ups and then um and the pre-choruses with like the hook. And then you have like this like drop where the first drops kind of like this Rasta. And it actually, yeah, you'll hear it when you hear the song, I took this scratching DJ sound and layered it with a, uh, it was like this weird, like flop, like, pop, pop. and I layered the two tones. So it's like this chop, chop, chop. And like, they goes like, boom, like chop, 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 chop. And it just like has this cool tone. And then like this, and it has like him singing in between that. And I know I'm like going all crazy with the song, but then the last drop has like a nice, like the bait. It, it's like, I usually don't do that big, like, I call it the base flood. Like, you know, in a sub flood, it's like an eight, like a sub flood. It's just like clean open sub. But this is like when you have like an artist, like you like bass nectar has those like big bass floods of like the, the vibrant, like resonant bass. Like, yeah. This has a really cool, like resonant bass flood type, like hybrid second drop that I usually don't do, but it just sounds so smooth, even though it sounds so like big that yeah. it just works. So I'm, I'm glad that this song is such a showcase of, it has a reggae element with the verse, like the reggae bass with like a fat sound, but then it has like, the future base element and then it has like rasta <coughs> mixed with like modest yahoo and a jamaican dude so it's like the craziest collaboration that dude honestly is there was another version of that song that was made years ago but was with a different rapper and i'm not going to say who it is but the dude got caught up in the scene and we couldn't put it out because of the dude's mistakes he made and we had to cancel that song <coughs> and uh basically redid the beat and met modest in i think at forest again and we like just re-went with it and dude like and he did his vocals. We got a dude from Jamaica that he recommended and it's a cool song. Like it's just a unique vibe and I'm excited. We have a full music video for that. That's high production. Dude, I got, went out to New York, got modest to film his parts was with him when we filmed the parts. Like don't, we didn't do anything together because I wanted his sections to be like him doing his stuff, you know, but um, it, it flows so well with the video. And uh, now we're just finally going to get to put that out. That would have been out last year, but because of COVID yeah, it didn't happen. But dude, the beauty of this is, you know, I took this kind of, I don't want to say a hiatus, but um, there is going to be a time when shows are going to come back, you know, even if it's 2022, like more fully, but like, basically I, it's kind of fun because I have all this stuff to put out in this trajectory that'll kind of build some hype to when shows do come back. And that's the point is to kind of build more of a fan base online, like spread the vibe outside of just doing usually what I usually do. This is like kind of bigger stuff I'm working with, you know, an album, bigger collabs, uh, bigger remixes there's more time that's going to go into these releases. You know, we've had time to think and like be smart. So I think that that's totally so much smarter than just having like, I almost like that that's going to be happening because a lot of people, dude, I'll be honest, put out a lot of content during quarantine. I think like wasted a lot of their content because like they put out these remixes and big tracks and I'm like, that's not going to translate into maybe like, maybe I get a few more followers or a few more listeners, but like, dude, you should like time that, you know, I feel like, and then some people are like struggling right now. Like, I don't know who, but like, I know there's artists out there that are like, fuck, I don't have content. Like I've been trying to do all these streams. I've been doing a million things to get through quarantine. And now things are might be getting back to normal. And they've exhausted so much of this. Uh, you know, I call it like the tank. You have this tank of content. And a lot of people are like going thin, dude, because they pushed so much out to try to stay relevant during quarantine. And like, I kind of was like, I'm going to maybe invert this. And I posted, like, I'm going to take a break for a little bit on socials. And I went hard, dude, for two months and just rebrought stuff from back last year, get a lot of new stuff ready. And now I literally have like, months of content um beyond the releases there's just content that's me populating every day on, on instagram it's really cool new stuff and Great. that's like even like the new video that the first video i put out um we're just doing a new thing with the process and like that video has like seventeen thousand or eighteen thousand views and that's just the gopro jam and like just like the the the, the trajectory is going to be picking up with that and you know i'm just being smarter with the way i'm using it so um and that's not even doing sponsorship stuff so we're just going to be like smarter using the platform and just 
it's about consistency and breaking the algorithm, which we're going to be doing with this new content. So um, I literally have like a whole plan with that. And then honestly, more, more music will be created, but I literally have like, if I want all the way up to like, yeah, I mean with this, so Blue Remix and then Too Close to Touch Remix, first album single, Modest Yahoo song, second album or third album single. And by that time, which is like seven, eight months from now, I'll have a bunch of other content. So, you know what I mean? Like more will be created. So I'm literally like set dude for the next like, eight, nine months. And that's a lot of time to make new stuff. So amidst that, I have other work I'm doing, but I will have plenty of time to then recreate new things. But I'm kind of like, I have at least this huge rollout set. And that's just dude, so much more relieving than how I felt when I when did it January 1st is like celebrate the new year. I was like, this is the first year that I have no shows, no releases planned, nothing like fuck this. Like, let me take a moment and like rework this. And I think that now I just have a whole new energy. Things have been like just going really Good. And I really will say as like a karma thing, I think positivity is such an important thing with like, and we all deal with so many frustrations with production or with like little moments with doing this. And I think that just the more positivity you can have with the energy you're putting into what you're doing. And even if it's giving you that vibe back, like more good things will happen, you know? And I think that even though I'm, we're all still coming out of quarantine, like the more positivity and those vibes I've put into what I'm doing these last few months, like dude, so much random good shit is starting to pop up where like literally like even this show, like this dude, I always wanted to hit me up and I would finish something. Literally, I had this thing where I'd finish a big task in Ableton and I'd get like a good message from someone or like, literally, dude, I'd be working on music and then finish this track edit. Oh, here's like a cool opportunity. Like it was weird things were happening last month. Like even with this push too, I was like working on a mix and then like I finished it and like got hit up like, Hey, you want to push too? Like, let's work some stuff out, you know? So it's like these weird things have kind of, I guess like snowballed where I'm just kind of going on this flow of like, let me stay positive and you know work with like true intent of like just want to do what feels right but also you know as being professional so it's like a hybrid of all that and that's kind of where i'm at you know that's awesome sounds like you definitely got a lot of things coming in the works and i'm excited to see a lot of it i'm sure a lot of people listening are as well and it's good you're just trusting that process it's been a weird year yeah. but like it sounds like you just kind of bunkered down and went all in and at the same time, taking care of your mental health, like just skateboarding with VR and stuff oh, yeah. to kind of have that little break when you need it. Super key. Yeah. yeah. I need to go skate. It's actually really beautiful. You can't see it. It's like really pretty out. And I'm not going to skate today, but definitely um, I need to skate soon because I, I, do, I just played a show. So I have a whole thing where I'm like, if I just played a show and I don't have shows for a minute, like I always wear like a wrist guard, but like I just am super sketched about like skating when I have a lot of stuff going on. So I. Yeah. We'll probably take it light still because I have a few more videos I want to make. But dude, after like in three weeks from now, if I don't have shows for a minute, I'm about to put my wrist guards on and you'll see you'll see me at the park for sure. And Tony so, Hawk getting down. Love I'm it. Just, yeah, I used to skateboard back in the day. I was terrible at it, but I had fun doing it. Yeah, skating's dude, I have so much respect for good skateboarders. I have some friends in Cali that are like amazing, like Elliot Sloan. Or, uh, he's like a mega ramp skater. He's like, a, he's an X games gold medalist. And dude, I've been there when they're training at Bob's mega at uh, the dreamland. Coolest thing I've ever seen. I mean, literally it's a roller coaster that people are like, it's, it's a 62 foot gap and they're doing kickflip. He could do kickflip in these seven twenties on that thing. And it's like, he could do like his tail sevens. He was actually training his tail nine for the X game. Dude, I was watching this dude go like on the quarter pipe, like 25, 27 feet out of a 32 foot quarter pipe. You like 58 feet in the air, spinning a tail grab 900 and watching Tom Shar. I saw Tom Shar as this like other pro when he was a kid, just training there. And his mom's like sitting on a little, like his parents are there on little, like little chairs, like watching this little 10 year old kid, like whatever, 12, hitting fucking 65 foot gap. Dude, and, and it's so chill. Like you have to be fearless, but like the element of like commitment and like the dedication and like you can get broke off, but when people land their stuff and they make it look good, it's magical and it's nothing but inspiration. And I think that. It can all, it can then be, it applies to so much more than just skating. Like if you're into skating, you can like appreciate other things in life. Cause it just shows you that like creativity can come from like nothing, you know, and that's what skateboarding is about. It's like taking a random object and you can do a trick on it. And that's like, you know, that's what it's all about. It's like Ableton, you can take any sound and do a trick with it, make it into a song, you know? So man, it can be a, like not afraid to fail and fall on your arm and break it a few times or like, you know, even in music, putting out like music or you get started being okay with making yeah. shitty music first before you get good at it you know so true. You, you will you, you will fail when you're learning production but then you will succeed as yeah. you get better at it you know so those things for i've been getting like you mentioned like playing a lot more like slower like four on the floor kind of shit like i've been into a lot of that lately just like I yeah it, 
No, I was just well, saying, wait, wait, wait. Oh, you're cutting out. Hello? No, go ahead. Oh, you might have just cut out for one second. The, uh, this show specifically, I wanted to like bring it in, like, I call it like the linear with the peak. And like, sometimes I'll make shows like a roller coaster, but this one was truly like had a really nice buildup. And then it kind of like 30, 40 minutes in, I just started playing more of the bangers and it was like 20 minutes just like, let's fucking go. And it was so fun to like captivate the crowd enough throughout the intro. And like, it wasn't like the perfect set, but it was so like well placed in like how I got to perform in the way of like brought them in, like got into the Sandman and all that stuff. And like, they were there, but then like slowly started speaking a little more like of that intensity. And then like, when it was really time to go, it was just like, dude, they were, they were already in it, but then it was like, let's fucking dance. You know, it was just like, it was really fun. And I like to think about that. I almost want to do sets where it's like, instead of the linear peak, you can do like build up, go intense and then drop like a little bit and then really bug. So it's like the double, you know, that's kind of how they are. Yeah. But, uh, I think that you can't, the, the issue that if you go too hard and then you go too soft though, then it like, you'll lose people. So you have to like be conscious of that some do, do the dubstep guys will play like, the heaviest track and then they'll like play like a really chill track. And I'll be like, I'm bored now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's feels- a certain element of that, but you know, it's all its own process. Especially with heavy dance music, like you got to be able to create that vibe. You can't just have people raging like for an hour straight. Like I hear that all the time at festivals. I'm just like, bro, what are you doing? It's just too much. Like you got to have that kind of thing. You know, it's like like going on a date. Like you're dating the crowd. You don't just want to like pick her up and start eating her face in public. Like you gotta you gotta slowly work in and just like get to know each other. You get to know the crowd. You're building up that vibe. You're creating that experience. Yeah, yeah. But you also don't want to like bore people. So it's like the weird fine line of like doing something that like captivates but isn't like overpowering and that's i think where people get lost because you're like go hard right away like even like i mean even the big guys go hard right away and then they kind of get like boring after 15 20 even if it's like a big dj set like i've i'm sure you've seen like a big artist and you're like this is cool and then you're like 20 minutes 30 minutes and you're like okay you know what i mean yeah. so, so i try to be or it's like still good enough and not good it's still gonna be vibey as hell but like carries you into that next level it's like let's go on a journey so like yeah, I'm so excited for like future shows and fest too because I just have so much more music and ways to create sets more dynamically and like you know yeah with the push and all the other push too like I'll be bringing that on the stage at some point so there'll be a day where this this thing isn't just on a couch he's like a cat it's like a, it's like a push cat he's just always on the couch push so. yeah you should definitely make some videos with your cat on the push that'd be cool okay I'll be like it you can do like it I'll get the give one of the babies you can meet do it yeah. meet the whole family. Yeah, this one's this is Luna. She's super cute. Bring her in. Hey, Luna. <laughs> Let's see. Nice. How long have you? Yeah, had? They're like little like little monkey people. Like I'm just gonna cuddle for a second. She's like, Dad, what are you doing? Stop embarrassing. I know. <laughs> like she's gonna leave. Ready? She's out. She's like, I don't like this anymore. Okay, you can go. But yeah, dude. Cats. Um, cats are great. He's. I might have to sample like a collab with the other cat because he likes to step on the push. So I'm just going to set up some synths one day and just let the cat walk on it. It's amazing. That's look, look at look at they like the push. See, yeah, she loves it, man. She's like, let's yeah. do it. Look, this, that's an ad right there, bro. That's that's a good moment right there. The cat on the push. Yeah, the cats are awesome though. I I, I like the, the kitty vibe for sure. They're hilarious. Yeah, I'm I love dogs probably maybe a little more just because I like the cats I was raised with were like really petty and pretentious. But I do love cats. I love cats. Like the girl I'm dating, she has four cats. And they're all oh wow they all act like dogs though like they're all super chill she has a huge house was it would be monkey cat. that's that's the monkey cat for sure monkey cat yeah yeah well cats i feel like are more like doggies they're like some cats are very like just to themselves and you have like that like monkey cat which is more like the dog cat you know so if yeah that makes any sense you ever see those oh, yeah, like, it was funny. what's up i was gonna say you ever see those cockatoos in the studio like studio cockatoo videos that people have like cockatoo oh people? yeah I think that'd be the coolest to just have this bird that's just like dancing to your music while you're making beats all day. That's what I want. The shop where I get these little vapey things, they have a cockatoo. And so like I go in there or they, it's like some kind of bird. It like flies around and you're just like, it looks like all the colors of all the vapes. So I'm just like, that bird is like sponsored or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's hilarious. No, for sure. It's funny. Cause as you said about the late night thing, last night was one of those nights where I was like, I literally found like a new trick with like using soothe on one of my tracks. And I was just like going reprocessing stuff. And it was like, you know, I was probably up to like four last night. And then the cat this morning knocked over like this picture frame at like 7 a.m. So I was like having a crazy dream. And then I hear like, and I was like, what the heck? And I woke up like all crazy. So like, I was like, oh man. So yeah. I'm like still just adjusting the normality of my day, which is actually kind of fun to do this interview. So 
bro yeah, I, I like this uh, it's speaking of like crazy birds and waking up i have like a goose problem outside i don't know if you've heard it but i have like 15 geese outside of my window at all times just like screaming wow it's mating season so like, like you gotta sample them you gotta sample the geese oh, i did i put a sampler and made like a really thick goose synth like a couple uh -huh. ago it's amazing i'll send you a goose sample pack if you want it <laughs> dude the goose pack put on splice people fuck with that the official the, uh Manic Focus just did a really cool post of uh Yeah, I saw that of him like, with sampling notes. sounds from his like environment. And I was like, that's really cool. Like I was gonna think I was doing one of those or wanted to do one, but I was like, he did it good. So he did. Well, we'll have to do a producer challenge, dude. Sample your environment. I'll get the cat like doing shit. I'll get the dude, it's so cute. Oh. Yeah, she's just on that push. She's on that push. Dude, she's yeah. the next Ableton certified cat, the first one ever. Very first one. Yeah. No, that'd be great. Should definitely talk to Thomas and see if we can yeah. get certified. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's funny too because in the future, like I might like look into more like of that stuff, like because I do actually want to get like you know outside of music, like I love teaching. Um, I used to be a drum instructor. Just some you know final thoughts on this stuff. I used to teach a lot, and I really enjoy that. I've done a couple of the Ableton groups, and like you know, I was even working with this awesome guy recently, like teaching him a ton of stuff. This guy actually owns Think Jerky. Um, he's like a he owns like a beef jerky company, awesome. and uh, it was really cool having that experience. But then I was like, oh, I got to make all this new content, so I can't really do lessons right now. But in the future, like you know as I'm involved with the production side and the performance side, I do want to get into more of like, you know, either, I don't say the corporate side, but like behind the scenes, you know, I'd love to even do like, like do a NAM thing at some point. Like that people, I think this setup would be like sick at NAM to do an able to like, I mean, I don't know if you guys do able to showcases like in the future, like I could do a freaking push to really? showcase, I mean, not a shout out right now, but yeah, if you guys ever want to do that, like I'd go out there, I'd go to NAM and do a showcase for you guys, you know? Love that. Yeah. So I run the website live producers online. That's my Ableton training membership. And like, I'm always hitting up people to do webinars. So like when you have some free time yeah. on the road, you totally set that up. That'd be dope. Yeah. And that's something I'm definitely gonna get into more as I just like get past this rebuilding phase of getting everything back out is like, you know, giving back to the community more. Cause that's oh, man. the big thing, dude. I mean, people even say at the show, like it's inspiring this and I see the project live or like people haven't seen it. And I'm like, I usually just like to do what I do, but to hear people being getting inspired, it's not even like an ego thing. It's just like, that's fucking cool. And like to give inspiration is like one of the best things you can do. So yeah, I agree. very important. Um, I totally yeah. agree, man. That's good. That speaks a lot about you as a person. So that's cool. Sure, for sure. Yeah. Dope, man. So. Well, I, uh, I'm going to have to head out pretty soon, but like, this has been really cool, man. Thank you for joining the podcast. Definitely yeah. tell everybody before we sign off, like, where's the best place to connect with you and hang out? Um, yeah, I mean, mostly my biggest platform right now is definitely Instagram in terms of the, the consistent content, you know, Facebook's just a dude, like real quick nag on Facebook. There's a, a group that has like 1.2 million followers is banned on Epitaph. And I go to like, check them out, dude, their videos, like, and even with most artists, they had like 20 to 30 likes on videos that hadn't been like pushed yet and they're only they were like five days old and i'm like bro 1.2 million followers yeah. getting 20 30 likes or like 50 likes what the fuck is if i post on there and don't like i do i'll get like 20 likes or like 15 right. likes facebook's not a great platform right now for artists and you're only going to see bullshit so i would if you're an artist like instagram i mean i don't really do instagram is probably the best in terms of like getting content so you can do visual youtube obviously but yeah youtube you're going to see stuff instagram i think is like the best right now in terms of just like visual content seeing new stuff it's so diverse right now like you're going to see a lot on there. And then just, yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, the YouTube. So Instagram at CoFresh, that's C-O-F-R-E-S-H. Um, and then YouTube is just CoFresh. You just look me up and those are the main. You'll see some on Facebook. Yeah, you can, you guys want to, I'm on Facebook, whatever, or doing the normal thing. So yeah, uh, that's where to catch me up. And there's a lot of cool stuff coming. So, you know, I appreciate you guys bringing me out and I'm stoked to, you know, do more in the future. So we'll definitely be in tune. Yeah, good hang for sure. Uh, everybody listening yeah. right now, I'll include links in the show notes as usual to Kofresi if you want to go check all of his YouTube videos out, Instagram, all that good stuff. So go in there right now, check it out, click the button, give him a subscribe, yeah. like, follow, all that good stuff. Dude, thank Appreciate you man, for hanging out. Yeah, man, let's uh, course, maybe yeah. come on sometime in the future or set up like one of those webinar things we talked about. It'd be cool. I'm all about it, man. We'll definitely be in tune. Yeah, as soon as basically after this next like month, I'm going to have a little more fresh air in my mind. So nice. I'm excited. So, so yeah, well, I'm glad we snuck this in, dude. I'm about to get back to work and uh, hey. to get these masters done. So hell yeah, brother! Do Looking forward to that cat tutorial. It's gonna be great. Yes, yeah. This yeah, she's got it. She got it in a bit. So, all right, man. You have a great day, dude. Just enjoy, and we'll talk soon. All right. Yeah, for sure, man. You too. Later. Yo, thanks everybody for checking out the podcast. Quick reminder, if you want to grab my free Ableton Live 
11 shortcuts go to liveproducersonline.com slash live 11 shortcuts and download it for free also you will be subscribed to the newsletter so you'll receive emails and be the first to know when new podcast episodes come out and other cool stuff also if you want to purchase ableton live 11 i'd be glad to hook you up with a discount just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy ableton big thanks to Kofresi and melodics and audience for making this episode happen and i will see all of you next time